Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the July TAC meeting. This is Megan Tente, and as the TAC designated federal officer, I would like to call this meeting to order. We are very much looking forward to today's presentation. Before we begin, there are some logistical notes related to this meeting being held by teleconference. For TAC members and presenters, as well as commission participants, please keep your phones on mute when you are not speaking. If you would like to be recognized during a discussion, please message myself or TAC Chair Richard Gorelick via the WebEx app and we can connect you to get your questions. Chairman of the TAC, Richard Gorelick, will lead the meeting today. But first, TAC sponsor, Commissioner Quintens, will give his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Megan, and uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our sixth meeting of the Technology Advisory Committee, or the TAC. Uh, before we begin, as always, I would just like to express my, my deep gratitude to all of the committee and subcommittee members uh, for so generously giving their time and energy and thought um, over uh, the last uh, certainly number of months, but uh, last number of, uh, of years um, uh, in, in general, but also in the preparation for today. Um, and uh, also especially in light of the challenges presented by preparing and holding this meeting uh, remotely. Um, I'm hopeful that um, everyone is able to connect, and uh, if, if we have any issues, uh, I think we'll try to work around them as best we can. Uh, but as usual, we have a lot of ground to cover uh, at the TAC. Uh, the TAC subcommittees have prepared very timely presentations for today, addressing issues that are really top of mind for uh, the Commission and for U.S. derivatives market participants including cybersecurity lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and the remote work environment, a discussion of the Commission's recently proposed rule on electronic trading risk principles, an update on the resiliency and scalability of DLT systems and potential use cases, an overview of central bank digital currencies and their place in the derivatives regulatory landscape, and an analysis of volatility in Bitcoin uh, compared to other asset classes. Our first panel uh, is going to focus on presentations from our cybersecurity subcommittee. The COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing social distancing efforts forced the transition of massive complex businesses to 100% work from home environments. Yet firms still face the same daunting challenges associated with protecting their confidential and in some cases highly proprietary data from cyber theft. To hear more about the important cybersecurity lessons learned from this unprecedented, unprecedented situation, Nina Neer, Director of Technology Operational Risk Management at Credit Suisse, and Jason Harrell, Head of Business and Government Cybersecurity Partnerships at the DTCC, will highlight some of the key differences between the operational challenges presented by COVID-19 and past cyber incidents. Relatedly, from a cyber perspective, though not necessarily from a COVID-19 pandemic perspective, we're then going to hear from Jerry Perillo, Chief Information Security Officer at ICE, and Hunter Landrum, Senior Counsel at Two Sigma Investments, about some of the significant risks raised by the collection, concentration, and storage of highly sensitive intellectual property during regulatory examinations, including policies and practices the Commission could adopt to mitigate these risks. I am hopeful that their discussion will dovetail well with the enormously productive and thorough work of my colleague, Commissioner Stump, in her data protection initiative. I look forward to continuing to use the tax expertise to supplement her great efforts. At our prior TAC meeting, the full committee voted in favor of recommending that the CFTC adopt a statement of support for the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council's cybersecurity profile. I'm very pleased to announce that, through a unanimous vote of the Commission, the CFTC has adopted language reflecting the tax cybersecurity recommendation. Today, the Commission is officially expressing its support for the use of standardized approaches to assessing cybersecurity preparedness, including the FISC cybersecurity profile. The statement should be released public publicly momentarily. During our second panel, Adam Nunes, Head of Business Development at Hudson River Trading, will lead a discussion on the CFTC's recently proposed rule on electronic trading risk principles. Mr. Nunes will discuss the subcommittee's assessment of the rulemaking's scope, 
including what constitutes the type of market disruption that the proposed rule is designed to prevent, detect, and mitigate. I look forward to hearing the views of TAC members on this rulemaking as well, and I appreciate that the diverse membership of the subcommittee reached a large degree of consensus. During our third panel, we'll hear from Shauna Hoffman, Global Cognitive Leader at IBM, Mark Pryor, the Chief Executive Officer of The Scene, and Yesha Yadav, Professor of, Law in Vanderbilt, uh, Professor of Law at Vanderbilt Law School, regarding the use, the use of DLT systems in the derivatives market. In particular, the panel will examine the challenges associated with developing and implementing DLT systems that are both resilient and scalable, including regulatory considerations involving permissioned versus non-permissioned systems and interoperability. The panel will also highlight the use of asset tokenization to track agricultural commodities and promote sustainable farming. Finally, we'll hear two presentations from our virtual currency subcommittee. First, my good friend, Dr. Chris Brummer, the Georgetown Law Professor and Faculty Director of the Institute of International Economic Law, will present on the design and evolution of central bank digital currency concepts, or CBDCs. The various proposals and development of CBDCs has been an area of particular interest to me, given the unique regulatory questions they present under the Commodity Exchange Act as potential fiat currencies or swaps. Dr. Brummer will also describe how widespread adoption of CBDCs could have an impact on the nature of financial intermediation in the derivatives markets. Regardless of the potential for or lack of official U.S. government action on its own CBDC, I believe it's important that the CFTC, given its role as a regulator of global derivatives products traded on U.S. DCMs or by U.S. customers, stays abreast of legal and regulatory questions in this space. Second and finally, Tom Chippis, Chief Executive Officer of ErisX, has prepared a fascinating presentation comparing the volatility of Bitcoin against other assets, such as stocks, both historically, but especially during the recent period of market volatility triggered by COVID-19. Mr. Chippis will also discuss the impact of COVID-19 on asset price correlations. Before I conclude, I just always like to recognize the hard work of Megan Tante, George Harada, John Coughlin, Scott Sloan, and Phil Ramondi for the tireless efforts in making this meeting a success. And I would like to express my deep appreciation for Richard Gorelick, our TAC chair, for his leadership and expertise. Uh, thank you very much, and Megan, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Commissioner Quintens. Chairman Tarbert, do you have opening remarks? Yes, good morning. Uh, very brief, and I want to thank you all first for attending the Technology Advisory Committee or TAC meeting via teleconference. I'd especially like to thank Commissioner Quintens for his leadership and his staff for convening the meeting. I'm also grateful to Megan Tente the designated federal officer for the TAC for organizing the meeting. And of course, I must also thank uh, Richard Gorelick for serving as TAC chair and all the TAC members for taking the time to share your valuable perspectives. The mission of the CFTC is to promote the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of U.S. derivatives markets through sound regulation. But as I've said before, we can't achieve this mission if we rest on our laurels particularly in relation to the ever-evolving technology that makes our derivatives markets the envy of the world. What is sound regulation today may not be sound regulation tomorrow. So that's why it's so important to have these gatherings of experts and innovators to advise the CFTC on the many technological issues under our purview. So in that vein, I see that we have a packed agenda for today's meeting. Uh, as Commissioner Quint Quintens mentioned, from cybersecurity to automated trading to DLT and digital assets, we seem to be covering the waterfront. I'll be particularly interested to hear the feedback uh, from the panel on our proposed rule on electronic trading principles. Um, my view on this is that the current proposal uh, that was voted out last month provides the flexibility needed to allow electronic trading practices to evolve while maintaining sound regulation. That's the ultimate goal. So I look forward to hearing this panel's view on the subject, and thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Tarbert. Um, Commissioner Benham? Thanks, Megan. Uh, good morning to everyone, uh, especially TAC members. And as has been said, I'd just like to reiterate um, our thanks from the commission and me specifically for your participation, volunteering your time and your commitment to this effort. Uh, specifically during these trying times in the past few months, we've all been occupied with 
um, many new challenges in our life, both at home and in the workplace. So your continued work and commitment to um, the advisory committees and, of course, TAC um, in the context of today's discussion is tremendously valuable and a great help to the commission. Um, of course, recognize Commissioner Quintens and his leadership um, uh, on the TAC uh, for many years now and bringing up these important issues for the commission to learn from. Um, do want to recognize Megan Tente and, of course, uh, Richard Gorlek, the committee chair. I uh, certainly look forward to today's uh, discussion. And as Commissioner Quintens mentioned, um, proud personally for the, the adoption of the cybersecurity recommendations from the commission. And I want to thank the TAC generally and the subcommittee uh, itself for making that recommendation uh, to the commission. Um, and also, I think it's important as we continue to discuss all of these important issues from digital currencies, automated trading, and of course, cybersecurity, we're seeing the effects of technology uh, in the workplace and at home um, growing at an ever-growing speed uh, and the challenges that uh, that they bring with them. And even as late as last night, I'm sure we've all seen the, the cyber hack that occurred with Twitter and um, conversations like this, although not directly related, um, are certainly, in my view, very helpful to sort of broadening the scope of what we need to do, I think, as policymakers and as market participants to build more resilient systems and to adopt technology because of its efficiencies and because it really is the future of how we're going to operate from an economic perspective and a business perspective. So i um, very pleased to be a part of today's discussion. Again, thanks to everyone for your participation and your time. Thanks for the leadership of all the committees and the subcommittees. And of course, thanks again to Commissioner Contends for his leadership. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Commissioner Benham. Um, Commissioner Berkowitz. Thank you, uh, Megan, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Quinten. Thanks, uh, Rich, uh, Richard Gorelick, and thank you all, um, CAC members, uh, for uh, for meeting with us uh, uh, today and uh, updating us on a, on a number of very timely issues. It's absolutely critical in this time where uh, we we are basically sequestered away from the agency and the normal uh, agency meetings and, and uh, communications have, have been um, significantly altered uh, by the, uh, the pandemic and the need for social distancing. So meetings like this where we're updated on emerging issues and uh, trends and, and market conditions are absolutely critical uh, for us at the commission to be able to uh, perform our, our functions properly and ensure that our, our markets are, are working properly. So I just want to thank all the TAC members uh, for taking the time to participate today. And I also know that uh, uh, a meeting like this requires a lot of time uh, beforehand uh, to make presentations, uh, to uh, get up to speed on all the issues and, and to distill it into uh, useful uh, useful packages of information for us uh, Jeff. So I just want to thank everybody involved for the time and effort and and these these meetings and our advisory committee meetings, uh, the TAC and, and, and the others uh, are just absolutely critical uh, for our, our business. So I, I want to thank you and I, and I look forward to today's topics and discussions. Thank you, Commissioner Berkowitz. Um, now I'll turn the meeting over to Richard Gorelick who will introduce the first panel. Thank you, Megan, and thank you Commissioner Quintens, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, TAC members, subcommittee members, and everyone participating today. I hope that you are all staying healthy and well during these difficult times. I'd like to get the meeting started so we can get to the interesting presentations that we've scheduled. We're going to start with the Cybersecurity Subcommittee where we will have two presentations. Uh, the first is about preliminary cybersecurity lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Nina Neer, the Director of Technology Operational Risk Management at Credit Suisse, and Jason Harrell, the Head of Business and Government Cybersecurity Partnerships at the DTCC, will be presenting on preliminary cybersecurity lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, then we will have a second presentation um, from Jerry Perullo, the Chief Information Security Officer at ICE, and Hunter Landrum, the Government Affairs Litigation and Enforcement uh, Head at Two Sigma Investments. Um, they will be presenting on CFTC collection, concentration, storage, and securing of sensitive information. 
I think we will go through both presentations first and then open up for questions and answers uh, for both groups of presenters. And with that, I will hand it over to Nina and Jason. Thank you very much. Um, before I get started, I, I first I want to thank uh, Commissioner Kintens for his leadership as a CFTC commissioner and for the, all the work that he's done to support the Technology Advisory Committee. Um, second, I want to thank uh, Richard Gorlick and the TAC members and the supporting staff who were able to pull this virtual event together during these difficult times. Um, I understand that this level of effort is way more than just setting up a conference call. And your dedication to making this happen is commended, and I thank you all for what you've done here. Um, I find it highly appropriate that a COVID lessons learned discussion is the first on today's agenda. Um, the COVID pandemic has placed enormous stress on the families and individuals that we depend on to run our business, uh, drive our economy, support our pastimes like sports and entertainment, and to provide a sense of normalcy. Uh, these have truly been unusual times. Today, Nina Nier and I are here representing the Cybersecurity Subcommittee to provide you with preliminary lessons learned from the financial services sector in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this has been a popular topic for many global supervisors, uh, regulators, standard setting bodies, uh, just looking to understand the operational resilience of financial institutions. I can say based on conversations both domestically and internationally that financial institutions have responded well to the pandemic and that supervisors and financial institutions have been able to sustain operations critical to the financial services sector. Um, in a moment, I'll share some of the impact that financial institutions have observed. Uh, my fellow subcommittee member will share actions taken by these institutions to mitigate these impacts and lessons learned by the financial services sector that will carry forward into the new normal. Uh, before this, we cannot stress enough that while this event did test financial institutions' operational resilience, it did not test the entirety of financial institutions' cyber resilience. Uh, we would be remiss if we did not point out that pandemic scenarios, um, uh, while certainly impactful, do afford financial institutions with some advantages when compared to cyber-based incident scenarios. Um, next slide. Well, okay, uh, there we go. Um, so first, we could see the pandemic coming. Um, response times could be measured in days or weeks as opposed to a cyber event, which provides response times measured in minutes or hours. This extra time allows for institutions to better plan and consult prior to deciding a course of action. Uh, secondly, financial institutions were affected in a manner that was symmetrical and in some ways equal. Uh, the pandemic has had a galvanizing effect for the sector as we are all facing the same set of circumstances. In the event of a material cyber incident, the compromised institution would be asymmetrically impacted when compared to other financial institutions and the sector. Um, third, third parties were also affected in a manner that was symmetrical. Financial institutions were not looking to establish relationships with alternate providers or executing exit strategies with third parties as may occur if that vendor suffered a material cyber event. Uh, given that backdrop, we can move to the impact that financial institutions, large and small, observed during this pandemic. Next slide. Um, for brevity, I'll cover only a few points on this slide. Uh, first, while financial institutions have previously implemented robust and secure remote working environments. They were not designed to support the entire workforce. The need to rapidly move to a new working model drove some institutions to quickly modify existing technologies. 
This move also put pressure on the telecommunications sector, which needed to support financial institutions by way of bandwidth increases uh, for their networks and uh, additional network traffic coming from home networks. Uh, Second, while the number of phishing attacks was raised slightly, the predominant backdrop of these attacks used COVID as the lure for employees to click on links. Um, for example, we saw you know, COVID heat maps, uh, donation sites, um, first responder support, uh, and health and safety information being some of the key um, lures for employees to click. Uh, the change in the working environment and work-life balance left some employees overstretched and more susceptible to these attacks. Uh, Third, the dependence on supply chains outside of national borders. Uh, Countries approached the management of the pandemic in in different manners. Financial institutions had to review their remote working policies and their ability to have continuity of service in the face of decisions that were made by numerous countries, which takes careful coordination and understanding of the pandemic impact in these countries. Um, Fourth, and the last thing I'll cover is more of a human element, and that is work-life balance, um, especially for families with children. Trying to teach and conduct childcare on top of a rigorous work schedule impacts productivity and the mental well-being of the workforce. Um, At this time, I will pass the floor to Nina who will talk to the actions financial institutions have taken in the face of this pandemic. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, all of the commissioners and the Technology Advisory Committee for hosting us here today. Uh, If we could move to the, the next slide, please. The next several slides will focus on firms' responses to the amplified risks that Jason described. And as in all things cybersecurity, we really need to think about best practices encompassing technology, people, and process. So if we consider first the technology front, in terms of elevated risk, many firms increase their threat monitoring or per, and or perform more frequent scanning for vulnerabilities, especially on their internet-facing application, applications. Attackers will be looking for new devices, new applications that may have been adopted quickly in response to this wide-scale work from home or improperly configured. From a people perspective, firms must continue to remind staff to remain vigilant against increased topical COVID-related phishing attempts that that Jason talked about. Employees are naturally going to be looking for information on on this topic. So in addition to reminding employees about being vigilant, providing accurate information on COVID is another important way that the firms can combat the temptation for employees to click on malicious links. We can also combine that with information on supporting employees' well-being. Again, Jason touched on the the very human and real aspect here. And a stressed employee is not at their best, either from a productivity perspective or from a susceptibility perspective to some sort of malicious attempt. If we combine the technology and personal aspect We also should be providing guidance on secure homeworking setup to employees. Finance in many ways is considered to be a digital business. However, individuals may not all be digitally secure in their home environments. Everyone's setup is going to be unique in their home, but providing tips on firewall setup, turning off IoT devices, or even just maintaining a a clean desk help prevent inadvertent data data leakage. If we consider process, 
as remote working raised the demand in many firms for new practices, think about the use of new collaboration tools like Zoom, Microsoft Teams, others that you may have encountered, firms need a fast but robust framework and process for approving or, or not, as the case may be, use of these new tools, new use cases on existing tools, and exceptions to previous prohibitions, for example, printing at home requests. Not only is it important to monitor usage of these tools or, or other exceptional items such as printing, but it's really important to take a step back and review those approvals and exceptions as the new working arrangements settle into a routine. What may have seemed imperative at a given point in time may look different when taken holistically. Overall exposure may not be within a, risk, a firm's risk appetite moving forward when you put all of that together. Uh, next slide, please. Let's also consider a few other areas of, of risk, starting and how we responded. Starting with infrastructure and application availability, especially during these times where we saw peaks of, of high volume and high volatility. The shift to remote working happened very quickly and at a scale, as many people before me this morning have mentioned, at a scale never seen before. For many of our firms, most if not all employees are working remotely. So first and, for, and foremost, ensuring capacity for remote working is in place is critical but that's not enough. Firms also needed to consider resiliency, plans for failover. Resilience can be maintained within a region, for example, through different data centers or different internet providers. Firms may also build out resilience across regions. There's no single right answer for all firms, but everyone's been thinking about this and responding to it. Don't be afraid to slow down to speed up. If the immediate priority around technology change is expanding capacity or resilience or just general system stability, it's okay to limit non-essential changes during these periods. Change freezes, heightened monitoring of critical applications all prove to be useful approaches for many firms. And of course, our third parties your supply chain. They are dealing with much the same risks as all of the, the financial services firms. Proactive engagement with critical suppliers is, is called for to assess their readiness and response, particularly in these uncharted times. Next slide, please. And so response to the elevated risk brought on by the pandemic are very wide ranging, as, as you can see. These highlight both firm strengths and opportunities for the long term. Firms need to consider how to carry these lessons into the future. For example, the COVID pandemic is a very timely reminder of tail end risk, whether it's cybersecurity, pandemic related, or a combination of both but this must be considered when assessing risk exposure. Scenarios, hypothetical scenarios, are a really useful tool in a firm's toolkit. Many firms have responded really well in these very unique times, but COVID provides ample opportunity to ask yourself, quote, what if? This allows firms to consider different aspects of their risk exposure that perhaps they hadn't considered through other types of assessment approaches. Understand what your crown jewels are, your critical assets, systems, third parties, data. Effective crisis response is quite difficult if, if you don't know what you're protect, protecting. And we touched on process earlier. Think cross-functionally about risk decisions. New requirements such as collabor for collaboration tools impact technology, cybersecurity, legal, data protection, digital growth, a, a wide range 
of angles and a wide range of perspectives is needed in risk decision making to get to the best outcome. And finally, never waste a good crisis. Firms can use this opportunity to assess what it means for their operating model. No firm moves forward without commitment of staff. Firms are thinking about what they've learned during the crisis about this new model, agility in this trying time, and how to manage risk. The world has changed, and these lessons, which may be unique in, in some ways to each firm, can and should be carried forward into the future. Thank you very much for the committee's attention. We look forward to questions in a few minutes. But first, I will hand over to my colleagues on the Cybersecurity Subcommittee, Jerry Perullo and Hunter Landrum, for their presentation. Thanks much. This is Jerry, and um, I'll jump right in in the interest of time here. Um, so thank you much uh, to, the, to the entire audience for paying attention to this. It's, um, I think this is a pretty important topic, and I know I personally have taken a few opportunities to speak with several of you directly when we had the chance uh, on this very topic. Uh, and I think it's great that, um, that, that the tax saw it worthwhile to get it in front of the agenda. Um, so jumping right into slide two here, um, let's just frame the issue a, a little bit. Uh, what this is really about is that during the examination process, and I should note that we run um, seven different entities that are under um, CFTC system safeguards, for example, uh, and they span um, or, or uniquely sit in the exchange vertical uh, and the clearinghouse vertical, so um, um, DCR as well as BMO. Uh, and uh, I've been here at ICE for almost 20 years now, and, and during that entire period, um, we've been operating under the CFTC. Um, so, and then we have a number of clearinghouse and exchanges uh, you know, under foreign jurisdictions as well, of course. And I just note that because, um, and describing the vantage point, you know, I've done a lot of comparison and seeing the way different regulatory bodies are, are um, handling these topics. And, and what this is really about is during the examination process, um, you know, obviously, to properly assess our cybersecurity posture, there's a lot of extremely sensitive data that really um, should be viewed. So, you know, we'll never question the, the reasons for viewing the data. Um, it almost always makes sense to support the examination process. Uh, the real question, the real point that we're bringing up here uh, is that it can be, can provide quite a bit of jeopardy to take a lot of this documentation and, and hypersensitive data, if you will, uh, off-site and to um, and burden the, the commission, uh, to burden the CFTC with having to protect that data uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and, you know, in this slide we mentioned critical national economic infrastructure, um, but obviously any regulated entity is germane here. And so it's really about, um, again, not the viewing of the data or the opining on it, but rather the collection of it, um, the, the concentration, what we're really focusing on there is that um, you know, having so many regulated entities having their data all in one place just makes it a very attractive target for a number of threat actors ranging from financially motivated and cyber criminals to um, nation states. Um, and then the uh, storage and security of it, um, you know, we all know in protecting our own data, um, you know, data has, has legs, it, it gets copied, um, it gets neglected. It's very hard, especially when things are retained for a long time on backup tapes, moved into multiple systems. Um, it, it's quite a challenge. Um, and you know, we all struggle with resources, and um, the best solution to any of these problems is usually to avoid it outright. Um, so you know, that, that really frames up the, the general challenge that we've had. And you know, when we assess risk, uh, whether it's internally in our own applications or with third parties or anything else, you know, we look for these types of patterns. You know, what, what's the when it comes to data security in particular? Um, what is the sensitive data? We immediately uh, come up with things like our penetration test results. Right, that can be a roadmap to the vulnerabilities that we have. Uh, when we simulate an attack on ourselves, we spend a lot of money and in many cases relax defenses and give uh, give extra advantages to the ethical hackers we pay, so we can do some what if scenarios. And when we take all of that. Um, and, you know, potentially put it in, in exposed to adversaries, um, it, it could be uh, catastrophic without a doubt. 
Uh, and then in addition, you know, we sometimes requests, uh, supervisor requests go so far as to uh, the individual names of user accounts that have access to privileged access. Um, and, and so that can be targeted as well. And even um, email addresses for phishing attacks and that sort of thing. We take all of that data collectively, uh, and that's the type of stuff that we, um, I can tell you the commission in particular among all of the regulators has been extremely reasonable. The actual supervisory staff uh, has been very collaborative, at least with our organization, and they've been very sympathetic to this, and they have been willing to work with us. Um, other, other regulatory bodies, other commissions, um, not so much. And, it, and it's not a geographic thing. I can't tell you that, you know, one whole region of the world is one way versus the other. It really just changes regulator by regulator and supervisor by supervisor, and, and things change over time. So what we're really after today is um, let's really memorialize this healthy practice that we've seen at the commission and, and get some guidance in here so we're not just um, living by the goodwill of a few individuals. So, um, Hunter, I'll turn it over to you as we get into slide three. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. And thank you very much to the commission for having us today. And Jerry introduced the issue very well. And I think in short, the concern is that much of the data being collected, including electronic information from you know, entities like Jerry's and involved in infrastructure, such as system diagrams, vulnerability reports, and penetration test results, as well as sensitive information related to trading from CTOs and CTAs, information such as source code, invest, investment theses, and descriptions and market tactics, would be extremely useful for an adversary planning a cyber attack against the CFTC, the markets it regulates, its registrants, or someone attempting to profit from the misappropriation of sensitive market-related information. Now, these concerns regarding the collection of this sensitive information have been taken up by a variety of United States government oversight groups, and the CFTC has dedicated itself to looking at this issue as Commissioner Quinton pointed out, Commissioner Stump's great work on data protection has been very informative. Unfortunately, though, this concern continues to be buoyed by actual breaches at national regulatory agencies, including the SEC. Now, we understand, as Jerry said, that this sensitive information can be useful for regulatory examination purposes, but we believe it can be viewed and accessed on site where it resides or in other ways where it's not duplicated and removed from secure institutional systems where it resides. As Jerry also noted, now various national and international regulators have taken different stances towards this data collection. Some regulators acknowledge the danger and agree not to collect this information and instead view it in more secure ways. Others insist on collecting it under the cover of regulation or record keeping requirements. But what we've been working with in the U.S. is currently U.S. regulators such as the CFTC have no clear policies and procedures to aid them in determining when and how sensitive information is reviewed. So on to the next slide. So what rule could come forward to address this concern? We think that to better align the CFTC's policies and procedures with its best-in-class practices regarding the limiting of collection of sensitive information, the CFTC should provide clear, concise, and up-to-date guidance on how the CFTC reviews highly sensitive cybersecurity artifacts and sensitive intellectual property in a way that doesn't compound risk. We think that is really what we're calling for here is just clear policies and procedures on when and how this information should be accessed, when it should be collected, and how it should be stored when it is collected by the CFTC. And so how should we inform that rule? Moving on to the next slide, I'll throw it back to Jerry to start talking about the risk analysis of this. Thanks, Hunter. Yeah, so I wanted to very briefly introduce this threat objective model because I know it's uh, somewhat bespoke and it's something that we've created at ICE um, over the years. But, you know, with all the different ways to talk about cybersecurity risk in particular, you know, we have threat actors and we have threat vectors and we have how somebody can do something and what they might do. And you have things like malware versus nation states, and they're not really parallel constructs. And we all struggle with that when we do things like trying to present the issue to um, through governance uh, and really tie a lot of our investments and processes uh, to the big picture. So we've come up with this threat objective model, which really focuses on the um, why, you know, what is the objective of the adversary. Uh, and by using that, we've been able to really model a, a finite number of threat objectives, and I won't go through them all, but just to give you an idea, it's things like um, theft of um, material non-public information. That is a threat objective to steal it. Uh, extortion, that is a threat objective of things like ransomware. 
uh, and sabotage is one that we as a critical infrastructure provider um, think about quite a bit. And it's really helpful because it allows us to take something that comes in off of the news, uh, something like a, a PII theft at an Equifax, and immediately slot it into, and um, that happens to be a threat objective, PII theft, versus sabotage that we're very concerned with, and that will cause us to really focus on other types of attacks, such as the, um, the Sony attack even, or, or something like that. So using that, um, the way that we handle everything is we have an inherent risk for each of those and then residual risk. And the inherent risk, we really use threat intelligence, and that's where we start with, is this happening in the wild? What did it look like? And, and that way we can game play. How would that look? How would that materialize in our own environment? And then the residual risk, of course, is, well, after we've taken a, a actions and, and installed measures and compensating controls and um, where we landed here so that we can um, announce that risk internally and track it and choose if we need to invest more um, to, to mitigate it further. So the inherent likelihood and impact of something like um, the threat objectives that we're really intimating here with, with this issue, uh, the concentration risk of having this, um, the, the sensitive data in a single spot, um, you know, the objectives of that can range from a nation state taking it to perform sabotage against uh, in critical infrastructure to uh, extortion even um, against uh, the entities that are regulated. Um, to even financial fraud, because a lot of these types of things would, would allow someone to get into an organization internally, and then um, all kinds of things can happen. So when we look at the inherent likelihood of those, it's extremely high, and that goes straight to the threat intelligence, and really the news cycle tells everyone that. You know, we, Every day we hear about um, everything I just mentioned. There's different threat actors that are trying that all the time. So we know there are interested parties. We know they're willing to try really hard, even against a single institution, to get this type of data. So we can only surmise that if they could go to one institution and get data on many regulated entities, uh, it would be extremely attractive. Uh, the inherent impact, um, I, I think we would get quick agreement on that, that it would be uh, pretty catastrophic if that type of thing was able to uh, occur and the adversary was able to use that to actually shut down um, critical infrastructure, no less steel data or anything like that. So that's the inherent side. Now on the residual side, um, that's where, you know, internally we look at our controls. So when we look at the residual um, impact, that's where internally we look at things like segmentation. All right, we can lower the residual impact if we can keep data in separate pockets or something like that. So if somebody were to get in and access one bit, um, they wouldn't be able to access another. So things like our subsidiaries and our different clearinghouses and how we divide those, we do that to lower residual impact. So concentration risk and getting it all into one entity and into the commission um, is clearly, you know, goes against that. So we, we don't see a, a strong way to really, um, you know, abate that impact. But on the likelihood, that's where really we get into the weeds on or how do we protect this data and whether it's encrypted and access control and on and on. And that's where I hearken back to the you know, noting that we see the challenges even in our uh, relatively well-resourced groups. And I know, you know, having talking to, uh, having spoken um, to your staff many times that, you know, that's a constant struggle, of course, uh, and it only makes sense. Uh, and again, it's a problem better avoided full stop uh, if possible. So you know, I'd rather, um, I mentioned that in that, I, we see with some regulatory bodies, we run into the idea of, well, we'll get more attestations or we'll make more of an investment and then that'll solve this problem. And I really like to focus on the, uh, on, on the concept of avoiding the problem outright because it is a extremely difficult even for a well-resourced organization uh, and even more so uh, for the commission, I'd say. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. And I think I would note that, you know, against the backdrop of limited budgets available to protect resources and the high level of targeting attracted by the concentration of data at a regulatory agency, and we think it's important that the CFTC both reduce the amount of information it collects and also shift the burden of retention on to market participants. So I said it divides the information into more places. It reduces budget demands on the CFTC, and we think it provides a safer environment, you know, for market participants and infrastructure providers. And that moves us on to the next slide. Thanks, Hunter. Um, right, so that brings us to the, to the conclusion slide here. Um, and, you know, what we're really, what we're really asking for and prevailing upon you for um, is if policies and procedure 
um, to you know allow regulated institutions to rely on the CFC to pursue less invasive tactics uh, for certain data. And we have some wording, but you know we're open to feedback on that, of course, to really define and ring fence that specific type of data um, where an on-site review is a reasonable substitute. So, for example, in our case, um, you know, we, we, we're willing and have made things available uh, in D.C. And I think that in the major financial cities, um, that's reasonable to expect of a regulated entity. I don't think it would work well for an entity to say you have to fly to, you know, Kansas City to review everything every time. Um, but of all the – and you know, we run a number of groups where we speak with all of the, um, the, the major clearinghouses and exchanges – in the U.S. and abroad, and uh, I've never seen any pushback on that. They always have um, government affairs offices in D.C. at a minimum. Um, and then, you know, what this can run into and, and what can really cause a problem from the goodwill that we have today would be a different interpretation on things like record keeping and work paper retention requirements. So to get ahead of that, um, we're specifically asking for relief from those to be spelled out um, in other words, yes, you should normally take all the notes, I mean, all the work papers that you have and all, everything that underpins all your conclusions, but where information is in this category that we are spelling out, um, it is reasonable to have redacted note-taking um, to really show the, the calculus and the thought process from the supervisory staff without listing out all of the vulnerabilities um, and potential you know, jeopardizing information in detail. So that brings us to the end of our conclusion, and I'll hand it back because I know we have a, a pretty broad swath of Q&A. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry, Hunter, Jason, and Nina. I now ask the committee, the commissioners, um, if there are any questions uh, related to these panels, to these presentations. If you have questions, feel free to message me by uh, the WebEx, and I will call on you. In the meantime, I'll start off with one question from the first presentation. Nina and Jason, I saw that one of your recommendations was to disable IoT devices. Wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and what some of the risks might be in a home setting uh, from IoT devices that are not usually found in offices. Sure. Or if that's the, if that's the risk that you're you're trying to address with that recommendation, that that's that's exactly that's exactly right. And you know, in in some cases, firms are starting to use IoT devices with within their their firm. But but let's talk about it in in the home setting. These are tools that can provide great convenience in a home, but they listen. You know, they, they listen to what's being said. Individuals are now regularly on conference calls for their for their firms. They may be talking about sensitive information, intellectual property, uh, material on public information, other types of, of confidential sensitive information. And, you know, it's very difficult to, to know as a layperson how how to deal with your IoT device, what they're listening to, who may be hacking in, we hope not, but hacking into that device stream, you know, from your home, from from the internet, through your own personal Wi Fi. And so it's an avenue that just doesn't exist in the same way as within as within the, the firm. So it's all about data leakage, external data leakage. And Jason, I, I welcome you to, to add any comment on that. I, I think that you pretty much covered it. I, I don't see anything additional to add. Okay, thank you. And then I've got another question here. What what are the practices that financial institutions have in place today that assisted them in responding to the pandemic? So I'll take that one. Uh, I think there's a few things that um, firms actually have as part of their um, response that really um, 
played a role in helping them during the pandemic. I, I would say the first one is, is, you know, tabletop ex- exercises, and that is, you know, working through um, your decision-making tree, with, whether it's with uh, senior and executive management, whether it's with uh, some of the operational uh, areas, and, and kind of playing out the scenario, uh, throwing different injects, and in that will take twists and turns. Uh, as you learn more information, so it, it simulates a real event. Uh, you know, forced absenteeism, which is the practice of um, having individuals who may play a key role in the response, not being able to participate in the, the tabletop, which forces secondary and tertiary um, employees to step in and be able to fill those shoes and that decreases some of the operational friction that may occur uh, during an event because you know it, it closely simulates um, that individuals may not be available uh, when you need them to in, in these types of events. Uh, and then uh, I'll just touch one more, um, you know, more from a business side is um, you know some of the things we do around liquidity modeling and making sure that uh, the markets continue to uh, function in an or- orderly manner, um, you know, by going through some of those uh, risk models and, and seeing how different impacts uh, to liquidity uh, could materialize, that also prepared us to, uh, as DTCC, to be able to respond um, and, and keep an orderly, fair and orderly market place. Okay, thank you, Jason. Are there any more questions for these panels? Okay, with that, then I propose that we go into a can break and we will resume at 11 Eastern Time for the Trading Market Subcommittee presentations. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much to uh, our panelists today, and uh, talk to you soon. Okay, here we go. So right now we will hear from Adam Nunes, the head of business development at Hudson River Trading. Adam will be presenting uh, on behalf of the Automated and Modern Trading Market Subcommittee an analysis of the CFTC's proposed rules on electronic trading risk principles. And with that, I will hand it over to Adam. All right, thank you, Richard. And- Thanks to the, the chairman, commissioners, and commission staff for their work on the rulemaking. Um, as many, or hopefully most of you know, the, the rulemaking seeks to enhance and ensure the resilience of the futures markets, or the U.S. futures markets. So briefly, the proposed regulations consist of three principles that will be applicable to DCMs. The first is the implementation of exchange rules applicable to market participants to prevent, detect, and mitigate market disruptions and system anomalies associated with electronic trading. The second principle is the implementation of exchange-based pre-trade risk controls for all electronic orders. And the third principle requires the prompt notification of the commission by DCMs of any significant disruptions of their electronic trading platforms. The rulemaking rightfully notes that many of these protections are already in place, and I think it's important to recognize that you know we, we are coming at this from a position of strength. But they do provide a framework for oversight and to ensure that you know these protections are enhanced and continue to evolve as you know the markets and market participants continue to innovate into the future. The subcommittee broadly supports the, the rulemaking, and since we didn't have any you know particular points on the on the principles, we decided it would be best for us to focus on some of the questions that were posed in the rulemaking. So if we can go to the next slide. All right. So the, the first relates to the definition <clears throat> of electronic trading, and we would note that the definition is pretty broad in the proposal, um, but we believe that for the purposes of the rulemaking, 
which you know aims to address the potential risk to a DCM's trading platform <clears throat> of disruption that the differences between a manual order entered into an automated trading system and a fully automated order as part of an automated trading system pose many of the same risks. So because these risks you know, can be, you know, exhibited on the exchange um, in the same manner. And to be fair, some of the risks associated with might not even be order entry or cancellation of orders. It could be, you know, just the more nuts and bolts of connecting to the exchange system and so on and so forth. Um, we believe that the definition being broad, including manual orders ent entered into um, electronic trading systems is appropriate. Um, we did note that the risks of those two can be different. Um, and I think that our view was that the risk-based approach that the principals provide to the DCMs was appropriate. And if they viewed it to be the right thing to do, that they could make distinctions within that, but that you know the broad principles and the broad definition were you know appropriate for, for the rulemaking. All right, uh, we can go to the next slide. So this has to do with the use of the term market disruption um, and kind of seek if that was the appropriate term or if there are other terms, you know, trading disruptions, trading operations disruption would be more appropriate or more appropriately capture what, we're, what we were seeking. So the rulemaking notes a market disruption as an event originating with a market participant that significantly disrupts the operation of the DCM on which the participant is trading or the ability of other market participants <clears throat> to trade on the DCM on which you know the market participant is trading. So the first portion of this is pretty clear and is pretty easy to define and perhaps would warrant a different you know definition that is more specific. But the latter portion is a, a bit more amorphous as to how to define it. And given that, we, we believe that the term market disruption was the appropriate term like, because it is a more broad definition. It should sufficiently capture the more broad array of the types of events that the rulemaking notes. So again, we, we tend to agree with the definition that, that was used in the rulemaking. Okay, yeah, can go next slide. So this gets to what types of events constitute a market disruption and what type of trading halts. Um, this one we view to be, you know, kind of it, it harkens back to the like two part definition, one being you know, a, a DCM system outage, and then the other being, you know, impeding other market particip participants' ability to trade and discover price. So I think on the, you know, DCM trading system side, that should be reasonably clear. I think that there are questions as to what type of scope of issue would fall in. The rulemaking does use the, the term significant. Um, but you know, we, we, when I think about this, I think about you know impairing the exchange's matching engine, impairing you know other critical pieces of infrastructure which are going to depend on the architecture of the exchange. But you know, it could be a switch that's used by many market participants, you know, a gateway that's used by many market participants, a load balancer, you know, a sequencer, just different pieces of the exchange infrastructure that are critical for its function. Um, and most of these I would view as, you know, being things that would, you know, generally be characterized as an outage to a meaningful, you know, portion of the market participants or the entire exchange. The second type I think is more difficult to clearly define. Um, the rulemaking does note that this is additive to you know, existing regulations that focus on market disruptions more generally. And there are also, you know, there, there are also rules in place for disruptive trading practices. So to me, that raises the question of the scope 
of the rulemaking and you know which types of events it is it is focused on. So one question is really comes down to when trading is not halted, but during which participants either can't trade or can't effectively manage risk risk or engage in price discovery. And unfortunately, these are somewhat difficult to define ahead of time. Um, I think that it is worth noting that I view that as a positive part of a principles-based approach because it allows, you know, it allows the DCMs and, and the commission to capture those types of events, um, you know, based on the principle as opposed to having a list and then there's a market disruption that isn't on the list and, you know, somehow isn't captured. So there are a couple of things that were noted that were, were I viewed as out of scope because they are separately covered. So one thing that was noted is a limit up or limit down event, you know, may not be a market disruption, you know, to the extent that that is the result of price discovery, you know, it should not be. Um, the rulemaking also notes excessive messaging, and, you know, this is an example where excessive messaging can be disruptive to other market participants, but it is not necessarily disruptive to other market participants, you know, certainly as it's currently defined um, by the DCMs when their messaging policies. So I think that is, you know, kind of highlights some of the nuance of what is in scope versus out of scope and how it's, you know, difficult to put a, a number on that. So another area to note is that market participants could have a technical issue um, and even submit erroneous orders that could not affect the exchange's trading system or other market participant, participants' ability to trade and manage risk. And there were a couple of um, events noted in the rulemaking that I, I can't judge, but you know, perhaps fit into that category where there was an issue with a with a member, and that member was fine for the issue, but that might not have reached the level of affecting the exchange's system or affecting other market participants. Um, a couple of other things to note on that front. Um, Participants might submit bona fide orders that cause sudden price movements, um, and they might, you know, cancel orders that, you know, a, a market maker may cancel orders that would reduce liquidity. But to the extent that that doesn't cause a market disruption or affect other market participants' ability to trade and manage risk, that seems like something that should be out of scope for the rulemaking. Um, and in fact, you know, on on the cancellation of orders, that might be a prudent thing to do based on risk controls or internal system issues at the firm. And then I think lastly, I would note that, you know, the, the rulemaking, you know, as I said, is additive to existing rulemaking. And I believe a number of the topics that I raised here are subject to some of the other areas, so I don't think that they are going uncovered. Um, I think it really just comes down to thinking about the scope of this rulemaking and where, you know, where there's overlap, which is the appropriate regulation to apply on the activity. All right, we can go to the next slide. So this gets to latency as a measure of market disruption. And the question is what amount of latency to other market participants should be considered a market disruption. And in the subcommittee's you know, dialogue about this, we found it very difficult to try to come up with a number that would be appropriate. And I think that there are a few things that go into that. One is Latency is a natural property of these trading systems, and when they're under more load, it goes up. It is generally the case that that load comes from, you know, many market participants during a period of high market activity. Um, so in that instance, a higher latency number might be fully appropriate. 
if it were during a period of lower market activity and was caused by perhaps a single market participant, then that might be sufficient to consider disruption. I, I, I don't have a number that I would say uh, you know would be appropriate there. So we find we found it very difficult to pick a number. I think the other observation is whenever you pick a number, the world moves on and that number is going to change. And you know, I, I guess I used to work at a, an equities exchange, and I remember when we got to 20 milliseconds, thinking we were done. And today, those those response times are you know in the measured in microseconds. So uh, I think that we should be cautious of that and also be cautious of the, the fact that it's really latency conditioned on market conditions and conditioned on, um, you know, at what point that's just higher latency and at what point that's, that disrupts other market participants' ability to trade and manage risk or, you know, disrupts the exchange's ability to operate. All right. Um, next slide. So this question came down to, you know, the, to what extent the DCMs should should be permitted to differ in what rules they establish um, to prevent, detect, and mitigate market disruption system anomalies. So the subcommittee's view was generally that we anticipate that a number of the procedures and rules adopted by the DCMs will be similar or the same. However, permitting and providing for that flexibility we think is important for a couple of reasons. Um, first, we want the DCMs to establish the appropriate rules that are relevant for their trading system and their trading architecture, and we you know, recognize that those could be different enough to call for different rules and it, you know, should allow them to have rules that are more effective for their trading systems. And then the second part is that permitting that innovation will, over time, you know, improve best practices as we see exchanges innovate and come up with you know, new ways to ensure resilience. Um, that's something that you know, the market will see and other exchanges could, could adopt in the future. So we view that as being, you know, the rulemaking does provide for that. We view that as being a, a critical, um, you know, aspect of the rulemaking that it will allow evolution. So those were the questions that the subcommittee determined to address. Um, so at this point, I think we can take questions. We have a few other members of the subcommittee that are part of the full TAC who uh, I, I hope are going to join me in, in answering questions. Thank you, Adam. If there are uh, any members or uh, commissioners on the call who would like to ask questions at this point, please direct them uh, to me, and uh, I will be happy to relay them uh, off to the, the group and to address people to ask those questions. Okay, so let me maybe I'll start off uh, with uh, with the question here. You know, Adam, one thing that struck me as I was reading the rule proposal and as I was listening to your presentation here is how do you determine if something is unusual enough to be labeled a disruption? I know uh, the subcommittee talked about it and thought that latency measures were not the appropriate. Way to do it. Do you have any thoughts for the commission and for the exchanges who will be coming up with their own rules here about how to identify when a market condition or behavior has been unusual enough to be considered a disruption? Yeah, I think the the thing that I would start with is that I believe most or nearly all of the issues that would meet this threshold will actually be 
in the first part of the definition that you know effectively refers to an exchange system outage um, of you know of significant scale. So from my experience, and, and in fact a couple, or at least one of these was referenced in in the rulemaking. Um, there aren't that many things that happen, you know, in the market from a single participant that, you know, really inhibits other market participants' ability to trade effectively and manage risk. Um, and I, I don't have the answer, but, you know, one of the things that was referenced in the rulemaking was the just, you know, high degree of messaging in the euro dollar futures complex. Um, I think it was about a year ago, a little bit less. And that led to a much higher degree of messaging. Um, I don't believe it really affected the system latency in a way that, you know, was meaningful. Um, but, you know, and I feel like that kind of gives an example where I don't know which way the, the world should fall on that. Um, I think some market participants found it disruptive because it was a lot of messaging and it was a very different behavior than they had seen before. Um, I believe the activity was at least bona fide and like those were, you know, orders that were willing to trade and they had a purpose. Um, but I feel like that, you know, they, they noted a few things in the rulemaking that are borderline, and I think they're useful to examine um, to say, well, which side of the equation does this fall on? So I can imagine a circumstance where a, a single market participant is just sending so much traffic that, you know, like it's very difficult to get orders acknowledged and, you know, trades executed. Um, but I think that's a very extreme example, and I don't know that I've seen that example happen. Um, you know, it could be something like if, if the normal limit order book has, you know, 20,000 open orders and somebody sends a million open orders, even if they do it slowly, that might be disruptive to participants or the exchange. Um, but they're, you know, kind of events that we, we generally don't see. And I think part of the reason we generally don't see many of those is because you know, as, as I referenced, we do have pre-trade risk controls. So many of those things that could happen are already likely pre prevented. So that was a, a non-answer, but you know, I, I think it's a non-answer because it's rare and you know, drawing that line is going to be very difficult. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, Commissioner Berkovich, I understand you have a question. Yes, thank you, thank you, Richard, um, and um, thank you, thank you for the uh, help, helpful presentation. And, and my question goes along uh, the lines of exactly um, what you've uh, just just been talking about. And this is something um, um, was discussed at the, uh, the, the uh, commission meeting uh, on the proposal, um, and that's. Uh, the concept of preventing market disruptions versus preventing significant market disruptions, um, and uh, you've noticed the uh, the um, difficulty in sort of defining what a disruption is and where where do you draw the line? What's a significant market disruption? But I'm, I'm wondering why do we need or what is the value of having that that qualifier because if you have the qualifier that says thou shalt prevent significant market disruptions that almost seems to be permission that once that it's okay for one trader system or or certain trading methodologies or one market participants behavior you can affect other market participants a little bit but don't do it too much um, Where's the where's the material? What's a material disruption versus a non-material disruption? We're going to tolerate some interference, but not really if it too much affects price discovery. And I'm wondering if that really opens the door to why why do we why do we have um, 
one market participant being able to affect at all another market participant's ability to trade or, or discover prices. Now, the, the standard as proposed, it, if, as, as proposed, the rule would say, basically, um, thou shalt you know, have rules to prevent market disruptions. But then the guidance um, and, and the, um, the guidance along that uh, says, basically, you've got to do um, put on the appropriate controls that are, that are reasonably designed. So it's not a zero tolerance standard, um, but it says, you know, reasonably designed to prevent, it, it doesn't require a hundred percent effectiveness. It doesn't require a hundred percent zero tolerance. It says reasonably designed um, is it, it, in it. So if you had a, if you have a standard that says shall be reasonably designed to prevent one market participant from interfering with another market participant in, in any other way. Is that, is that workable? I'm just wondering why we need this concept of significant versus not significant market disruptions at all. And, and if, if it's ultimately a reasonably designed standard, uh, that's go going to govern, govern it. All right. That, thank, that's a great question and I'll, I'll give a response, but I would welcome other subcommittee members to, to chime in if they have anything to add. So as, as I thought through that question, many of the things that I came up with that, you know, would be one market participant affecting another, I think should generally be covered by other provisions. So, uh, you know, I, I noted that thinking through the scope of what types of things we want to cover here is important. So from my perspective, if one market participant knowingly attempts to impact another market participant, that should generally be covered under anti-fraud provisions, right? So that, you know, isn't just a technical blip. That is, you know, like a, a purposeful activity to affect another market participant. Um, I think that there, you know, similarly there is a disruptive trading practices rule that has to do with, you know, kind of certain trading practices that might disrupt price discovery or, you know, induce other market participants to, you know, to, to trade when they otherwise wouldn't. So, you know, as I thought through the scope of what we were discussing here, I think you, you need to understand when you submit an order or a cancel, you know, or, you know, make markets and submit many orders and cancels, that will affect the performance of the, of the DCM's trading system. And, you know, the trading systems are built to manage that order flow. Um, but if you're sending bona fide orders and, you know, trading, you know, in a fashion that doesn't disrupt other market participants, it just gets to what does disrupt, you know, what does it mean to disrupt? So we could see some behavior that, you know, we find to disrupt our approach to trading at my firm, but other market participants might be totally fine with it. And, you know, at that point, we need to adapt and move on because, you know, if somebody came up with a new strategy and it fit within the principles and the rules that were laid out by the, by the exchange. So I think that that is, uh, I don't know that I directly answered the question, but I think that, you know, there's some degree to which there should be some threshold because what's disruptive to one firm might be completely legitimate activity and might not disrupt many other firms. So I don't know if anyone has anything to add. Yeah, um, this is Julie um, Holzrichter. I, I think generally Adam really gave kind of the broad overview of some of the complexities um, with scope, but I think he really outlined very clearly that it was really based on the fact that we felt like a lot of um, the issues that we might encounter are already covered, um, as he said, under you know, different regulations and different rules. Um, I think when we're talking about the messaging, for example, since that, that, that was something that um, was raised, you know, just from the experience that we um, had with that specific situation, it was interesting because there were certain of our market participants who um, maybe were annoyed by it, but 
they have very different strategies that they deployed and so didn't didn't necessarily feel impacted by it. Their strategies continued to operate as they normally would. Um, so it was more of a, I think, just a, an annoyance, is, you know, to paraphrase some of the, the market participants' words. Um, others just found it a little bit more of an issue because of the, you know, consuming of the market data, but but not necessarily that it didn't allow them to enter orders or manage risk. Um, so I think what we did and what we continue to do and why I think the principles-based approach is so important is that, you know, we we're continuously innovating on our risk mitigation functionality so that we can look at, you know, behaviors or trading strategies that are developing or evolving and really, again, put in um, what I would agree with Commissioner on um, reasonably designed controls um, or reasonable rules to, to mitigate certain types of situations like this. So with respect to where do you draw the line, I do think that's a good conversation and one that we're all having, obviously, as these rules came out. I think we're all doing a little bit of our own um, analysis, having conversations, really trying to understand how we would view this. But in the messaging policy specifically and the issue that occurred, um, I just would share with the commission and with all of the, the um, participants on the phone that there were several different conversations with different um, market participants with very different views on that. Um, and so I, I don't think there's a black and white um, with some of these. And so I do think that further dialogue is appropriate. Hi, this is Chairman Tarbert. I, I just wanted to make a quick point, um, uh, just a clarification on, on, the, rule, uh, on the proposed uh, risk principles. Um, the proposed principles do make a distinction between market disruptions and significant market disruptions, but that deals with the reporting. So in other words, the, the, the requirement would be, if finalized in its current form, that DCMs uh, have systems designed to reasonably prevent and detect, et cetera, market disruptions and system anomalies you know, full stop. Now, there's a question as to what is a market, you know, what's a market disruption as opposed to some kind of smaller disruption. But the significant disruption deals with uh, what is required to be reported to the commission. Um, so, so I just wanted to make sure that there's that clarification and distinction uh, about, you know, the, the, the duties that would be required uh, if these rules, uh, principles went into effect. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, if we have more questions or comments from the TAC members, happy to continue with those. Okay, uh, in the meantime, I'll take the uh, Chair's prerogative here and ask another question. Um, you know, it's all on the sort of same topic of line drawing. Uh, you know, how do you, Adam, and, and if there are other committee members who'd like to chime in, think about the difference between sort of normal, sometimes messy price discovery and a market disruption, and sort of who should be in the play, who should be making those uh, decisions and distinctions? Um, that, that is a, a, a difficult question to answer. So I think that the, I think the principles cover that and it, you know, and they're basically putting it on the DCMs to come up with the rulemaking around that. So I think it, you know, comes down to how broad the issue is. Um, you know, the rulemaking noted that a limit up, limit down situation may not be a, a market disruption, 
but I think when it says may not be, it means, but it also could be. So, you know, to the extent that that was the result of, you know, a, a system anomaly occurring at a at a single market participant, then that would, you know, cause a cause a halt and, you know, cause a, like, you know, at least a, like a pause in trading and that limit other market participants' ability to trade and manage risk. So, you know, from my perspective, that's exactly what the second principle that deals with, you know, risk controls is designed to ensure or to, you know, kind of mitigate the potential for that. Um, but I don't have a good, I don't have a great answer for how you draw some of these lines. Um, and I think that that's, and perhaps how these lines are drawn changes over time as, you know, as risk controls improve and, and things like that. So, sorry, sorry, Richard. Um, maybe somebody else has, has better thoughts on that. Um, hi, it's Julie again. Yeah, Richard, I think, um, you know, when we look at price movement and um, price discovery in general, um, we always look at the balance that we need to make sure we have to allow legitimate price discovery, um, but also have, you know, various risk tools in place that really um, allows market participants to take a breather if they need to take a breather um, because maybe the market is moving, you know, very quickly within a very short duration of time. Um, we have put in place things like velocity logic and dynamic circuit breakers and, you know, price banding and, and all of those all of those types of functionalities um, in order to really, uh, you know, signal to the market that, that there is, you know, activity that's happening. And in all of those controls, they are very transparent so that the market participants really do understand exactly what's happening at each moment of time. What we generally um, see, though, is, you know, there are multiple um, participants that, that really are in the market during those periods for the most part. Um, if we do see a situation where it appears that a market um, moved a, a, a significant amount in a very short period of time, and it was really as a result of a single market participant um, and the activity from that single market participant is something that we, we uh, are curious about. I think those are the types of things that for us, you know, really do cause us to kind of think about it a little differently, look into it a little differently. And I think those are going to be on a case by case basis, but the market moving and price discovery happening and those controls, you know, being put in place um, to me, that's all part of, you know, the price discovery that happens during a normal market event, um, unless there's something that occurs that would cause us to think about it differently. And again, I would just reiterate that that really is on a case by case basis. Yeah, and I would just add to that, like even my example of a single market participant, you know, being the one that caused the price move, that might be bona fide. So I think Julie's response that, you know, that's something that should be looked into and not just defined is right. You know, that could be bona fide orders because they needed to hedge a position or there was news or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, absolutely. And Adam, honestly, that, that is the case, you know, many times when we do look into it further and it's, they're bona fide, they're looking to exit positions and they're doing it in a very, um, what would appear to be a very uh, legitimate way. It just happened to move the market. The market wasn't as liquid at the time. Um, so there was nothing nefarious about it per se. Um, and again, I think the controls that we have in place are really there so that other market participants understand what's happening. Um, that's why they're so transparent and people can really, you know, take a second to pause if they need to, et cetera. So Julie, if it's okay, I'll direct this, this question to you. Um, I think for many years in this committee, we've heard various presentations often from your, your predecessor on the committee, Brian Durkin, uh, about the various risk controls and processes to avoid uh, market disruptions at the CME. Uh, do you see this rule uh, 
changing anything significant for the CME? Um, you know, I, I think the, I think the commission and the industry has spent so much time really thinking through the different types of controls and measures that we might want to have. I think it's very responsible and prudent that we do it. So I do want to commend, you know, the staff and the commission. Um, I think we're all incentivized to have the right types of controls in place to have healthy markets, et cetera. So having said that, I think it allows us to really take, you know, a, a deeper look at what we have in place um, to take a deeper look at whether or not we may want to add additional risk mitigation functionality or we may want to tweak some of the functionality we have. Uh, and I think that's something that we're looking at. But I will say for the most part, I'm very, very pleased because I do think a lot of what um, we were able to achieve with this rulemaking is an acknowledgement of all the work that the industry has done um, through all of the you know, best practices that we've discussed in the past. Um, so I think this is additive, but I don't think it's going to necessarily require um, us to change how we're doing things drastically. I do think, though, it's important for us to focus a little bit more on what we may want to do to further um, enhance what we have. Okay, thank you, Julie. Are there any more questions at this point on this topic? Okay. If not that we will uh, take a break now, uh, a lunch break. We'll be back at, uh, let me check here quickly. It looks like noon Eastern time is when we'll be back. So it's a brief lunch break, and uh, we'll be back shortly to hear the next presentation from the Digital Distributed Ledger Technology and Market Infrastructure Subcommittee. Thank you, everyone, and we'll be back shortly. So uh, welcome back, everyone. We are now going to have a presentation from the Distributed Ledger Technology and Market Infrastructure Subcommittee. Uh, the presentation will be from Shauna Hoffman, the Global Cognitive Legal Leader at IBM, Mark Pryor, the CEO of the SEAM LLC, and Yesha Yadav, Professor of Law at Vanderbilt law school and the presentation will be an introduction to resiliency and scalability of DLT systems, use cases and regulatory picture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Take it Richard. away. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, this is Shauna Hoffman and we're really excited to have the opportunity to share with you today a little more about scalability and resiliency within the distributed ledger technology. So next slide. So since the outbreak of COVID-19, distrib distributed ledger technologies are exponentially increasing in popularity and gaining public awareness and corporate engagement. Let's go to the next slide. So DLT are shared distributed ledgers that can securely store digital transactions without using a central authority. Instead of managing the ledger by a central authority, each individual member holds a copy of the chain and reaches consensus on the ledger. New transactions are linked to prior transactions through cryptography, which makes DLT networks resilient and secure. Now, any changes in a single block would require computational effort and proof of work for all succeeding blocks. So as a result, a computational minority is outperformed with the computational power of all the other truthful miners, which makes DLT very resilient to malicious attacks. So as you can see here, resiliency and scalability are critical to the functioning of any DLT system in derivatives. Both values are connected. The more scalable a system, the greater the need for resiliency. Now, scalability can implicate considerations of system-wide risk and stability, making resiliency a priority in market design. In the early days of their development, the most well-known names in the industry, Bitcoin and Ethereum, had a maximum size uh, of their blocks, which was limited, in Bitcoin's case, to just one megabyte. Now, although this mechanism was designed to make Bitcoin more secure, with each transaction comes data, and with a maximum size of one megabyte per block, there's only so many payments that can be processed at once due to the size. Now, in order to improve scalability and resiliency, 
Many companies and research teams have proposed differing solutions. For example, off-chain scaling solutions ensure that certain transactions are completed, only essential information would be on the, on the DLT. Okay, next slide. So DLT is a digital system of data verification for transactions, assets, and users. DLT achieves an unforgeable and decentralized ledger by applying P2P network, cryptography, and consensus mechanism over a distributed network. That is a decentralized network and is automated. Network nodes automatically apply preset verification protocols to ensure that the data is authentic. A potential reason for decentralization use of DLT is improved resilience to faults in a traditional system. With respect to cyber attacks, Bitcoin, the oldest DLT implementation, has proven to be relatively resilient when compared to traditional systems. Network nodes rely on consensus to verify data accuracy and authenticity. Now, reaching consensus on which blocks to accept as valid in DLT is challenging. Consensus algorithms must be resilient to failure of nodes, delayed and corrupt messages, and be able to detect unreliable or malicious nodes. Now, once verified, data is cryptographically recorded on the ledger. The data is immutable and impervious to tampering. A DLT can clearly benefit system operations, markets, and consumers. DLT is a fast-moving area of research and development. Continued review, though, of this emerging technology is required to improve understanding, increase the body of knowledge, and realize potential. So I'd like to take this opportunity to hand off to Mark Pryor to share his insights on market applications within DLT. So Mark, uh, next slide. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, if you could go to the next side, slide, please. Okay, thank you uh, to the commissioners and to the to the TAC and guests. Uh, delighted to participate today on asset tokenization in agricultural commodities. So there are many exciting developments underway in agriculture, uh, as well as sustainability and digitization in general. <clears throat> you may have seen just in the past 24 hours some major announcements from big tech aligning and collaborating with agriculture sustainability. Uh, all these things have hit the press. So agriculture is certainly in the sights of many and for good reason. Next slide. So the topic of uh, the, the slides here is asset tokenization. So let's define what a token actually is. So there's several definitions out there, but the best one I've found is <clears throat> an abstract digital representation of some fact, some claim, or some phys physical object. So that's uh, the best type of definition that I've seen, a digital representation of something of value. Next slide, please. So tokens can represent physical assets, like a bale of cotton, for example, but they can also represent non-physical assets, like a carbon credit, carbon removal asset, as they call them, which typically represent one ton of carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere. Uh, additionally, another type of non-physical asset could be a token that represents a certain claim of verifiable, sustainably produced cotton. Next slide. The concept of tokenization is not new. In, agri in the agriculture space, we've had bearer bond paper warehouse receipts that represent ownership of a specific bale of cotton. The owner or the holder of, of this paper receipt is entitled or was entitled to receive that actual bale of cotton from the warehouse upon presenting the receipt or the token of ownership. In the mid-90s, these ownership receipts became much more abstract. Um, instead of having the paper receipt, you then had an electronic record that determined the ownership and the rights to the underlying commodity. 
So in cotton in the United States, 15 to 20 million of these records or tokens of ownership are managed in proprietary systems today. Uh, the proprietary part is what's changing now and advancing. Next slide. So there's two primary types of tokens. There are fungible tokens and there are non-fungible tokens. Fungible tokens, uh, as you can imagine, are interchangeable. One token represents representing carbon removal, for example, is the same as any other. One dollar bill can be interchanged with any other physical dollar bill. It's, it's okay. They're fungible. Bulk commodities fall into this line where uh, fungible tokens work well with, uh, with that side. Non-fungible tokens are not interchangeable. They represent something specific like a unique piece of, of art or an identity preserved commodity like a specific bale of cotton. Now, for those that aren't familiar with, with cotton, although two bales may be side by side and look just alike on the outside, the actual qualities are specific to that bale. So you may have one bale with the raw material that is suited for a fine quality dress shirt, whereas the other bale may be the type of quality that works well better with blue jeans. So different qualities, different different uh, uh, standards behind it, and therefore different value. Next slide, please. Now there's been much focus on the journey or the provenance of physical commodities for traceability and transparency for some time now. You know, you get it from uh, from the farm to the retailer, and in the case of cotton, we call it from dirt to shirt. But now it's getting more important, in fact, it's extremely important to the brands and the retailers and the consumers that the practices used in the production of those raw materials are also part of that provenance story. So there's this need, this desire, this demand in many cases to link the sustainable farming practices to the actual goods along the supply chain. The story is what's important. Next slide, please. So the scene has designed and released uh, a new agriculture sustainability platform that's science-based. It's got online self-assessment, field level, field print analysis for the environmental footprint and more. There's a mass balance chain of custody model built into this as well as identity preservation tracking and management. So the first crop to use the platform is cotton. And the National Cotton Council, who represents all U.S. cotton industry segments that includes producers, to ginners, to warehousers, to merchants, cottonseed, cooperatives, and manufacturers, has recently released the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol. This is a, a new voluntary farm-level program to engage uh, U.S. cotton farmers in continuous improvement towards sustainable cotton production. Now, the platform manages two types of tokens today. It manages both a fungible token where you have uh, a token that represents one kilogram of raw cotton that was verified, produced sustainably through the protocol. And then you have non-fungible tokens where you have specific identity preserved bales that are in, in the platform and managed as such. Next slide, please. We're now developing towards carbon removal assets, carbon credits. Uh, we're seeing a lot of news out there, as well as you are, on, on various initiatives like Amazon Climate Pledge Fund. They have a $2 billion uh, fund for, for uh, uh, advancing initiatives that can, can, can address the carbon issue. Microsoft as well. And there's lots of other announcements from big tech and big companies that are committing to carbon neutrality or committing to uh, being carbon negative. You may have seen some recent bipartisan bills from U.S. Senators um, to tackle climate change through agriculture. They have an initiative called the Growing Climate Solutions Act. And this is meant to establish U.S. certified protocols to make it simple for farmers to participate in carbon markets. So there's lots of focus here in carbon credit tokens and the advancement therein. I think there's a a real need for standards, as we'll talk about shortly. Next, next uh, slide, please. 
So in looking at standards um, in the Ethereum ecosystem, there's several standards uh, for tokens. You have the base ERC-20 standard that has been defined for some time. It's uh, useful for fungible tokens, would be useful for bulk commodities, but it's for interchangeable uh, representation of, um, of those assets, volume-based volume, volume -based claims and certificates. There's the 721 ERC um, that is for non-fungible tokens. This would be for representing one-of-a-kind products, one-of-a-kind commodities, identity-preserved commodities, like a bale of cotton. They have other standards, such as the ERC-998, which is a composable token. It's kind of interesting in that you have a digital asset that actually owns other assets, and the composition makes it more valuable. And then lastly, a fairly new standard for the Ethereum ecosystem is the uh, ERC-1155. This is a multi-token standard. It allows a, a single deployed contract can include a combination of both fungible and non-fungible tokens or many other configurations. So these standards are critical, and this is specific to the Ethereum ecosystem, but there's other initiatives going on as well. Next slide. In looking at the multi-token standards that are, that are out uh, with Ethereum, and if you look at it from a cotton perspective, you have these individual bales that have their own unique identities, and they can be represented by a uh, non-fungible token that we've been talking about. But you put those into a container. Typically, there's about 90 of those. And what you would prefer to do from a technological standpoint is to, is to reference all 90 with one token. So compartmentalizing, containerizing the transaction is something that's exciting and I think will provide some efficiencies uh, to the trade. So you can represent all 90 of those with one token, which also allows some batch operations, some efficiencies, some cost savings in the transaction uh, piece of that. So that's an exciting development and a standard that is uh, uh, answering some real problems uh, when you think about it. I like to use the analogy, when you go to the grocery store, you've got a basket full of goods in there. You know, you've, got, you've gone to the dairy aisle, you've gone to the meat department, you've got all kinds of stuff in your basket. And the way it was before, in the parallel to the, the token world, is you would have to transact individual items out of your basket with the cashier. So, okay, here's a, here's a loaf of bread. Okay, let's transact that, okay, and go through all that process. Now what, what, what else do you have in your basket? Instead of doing it that way, you can treat the transaction as one. So you have a collection of things, a collection of assets in this case, that you can work with as a whole. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. Next slide, please. On to other standard initiatives. It's not just Ethereum. We know that there's multiple uh, platforms, there's multiple ecosystems that are out there. There's an exciting new development um, from IWA, the Interwork Alliance. They're a nonprofit, member-led organization. Uh, several, several large companies are, are part of that, so Accenture, Microsoft, DTCC, IBM, R3, several to come together to define some standards upon which token, the, the token economy can, can work. Uh, interoperability is critical, and uh, you know that there's going to be several succeeding platforms and ecosystems, and they need to be able to work together. So this is a relatively new alliance that allows um, uh, the standards and collaboration around how those standards can be created. Next slide. So as you can see, there's a lot of advancement in agriculture uh, from the token digital ledger technology perspective. And these things are, are happening very quickly. You, you've, re you've read the recent press around big tech working in collaboration with agriculture initiatives. It, it's advancing more rapidly now than ever, and we're excited about where it's headed. Thank you. I'd like to hand it over now to Yesha. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Um, first off, uh, thank you at, at Church Harbor, Commissioner Quintent, uh, Commissioners uh, Megan and Richard. Um, thank you so very much for hosting um, this meeting at this significant um, and extremely difficult time. We know how difficult it is 
um, the enormous work, um, attention to detail that's involved in organizing a normal TAC meeting. Uh, to do it at this time um, um, at home in lockdown uh, remotely is just remarkable. So thank you so much. Um, in particular, I'd very much like to thank uh, the incredible staff here at the CFTC, uh, John Coughlin, uh, Phil Ramundi, uh, George Havada, and of course, Megan, um, for all the um, dedication, the organization, um, and the pandemic proof, um, terrific humor that they have brought to our conversations and discussions over these past few months. So it really has been a pleasure uh, to work uh, for this time meeting. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so as my co-panelists have been highlighting, um, there are a number of uh, regulatory issues for us to consider as we think about resiliency and scaling um, in the context of DLT. Um, as uh, Shauna mentioned, these values are essentially linked. Uh, the more scalable a system becomes, the higher the network effects. The more international the system becomes, the greater its interoperability. Um, and the functionality that it brings to the table, the more we have to worry about resiliency, the more we have to worry about the systemic impact on the market and making sure that any new technology that is developing in this space um, is, able to, uh, is able to maintain a continuing function um, and that the damage that any losses could cause do not reverberate into the system as a whole. Now, obviously, this sets up the classic bind when we're dealing with regulating financial innovations in this space, which is how to get the innovations to be scalable, um, resilient, but at the same time, uh, not to make the compliance cost uh, so high that we exclude potentially uh, innovators, smaller companies, newer companies that are uh, building in this space. Um, and so that really creates a challenge for us working in these markets uh, to balance these two values, to make sure that we're having scalable and resilient systems, but at the same time encouraging innovation so that we can get this nascent technology in the context of DLT off the ground and working and exploring the different use cases uh, that we can have. Um, uh, next slide, please, Megan. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, looking at um, looking at uh, DLT, um, uh, as Shauna mentioned, there are a number of core features here to DLT. We're looking at a distributed ledger um, that is decentralized, consensus-based validation, um, encryption um, throughout uh, the the ledger. But how the system is designed, the different functionalities that can be brought um, to the system, really affect the regulatory treatment uh, that the system will get. Now, the most, important, uh, the most important value that we have to consider, the most important design choice really, is in the difference between permissioned and non-permissioned systems. Um, in the context of permissioned, uh, in the context of non-permissioned systems, sorry, um, that is essentially what is being used in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, non-permissioned systems are arguably much more scalable, uh, but they certainly uh, imply a greater amount of risk. Now, in the context of markets, uh, permission systems are a great deal more desirable. They allow for the DLT operators to essentially control um, who gets to join, um, the conditions of joining the system, the conditions of joining the network, uh, making sure that uh, those who are participating within the network have the strong technology, the cryptography, the, uh, the ability to maintain resiliency um, in difficult periods, as well as, of course, the capital should they need it in order to pay for losses. Now, most importantly, from the purposes of the regulator, permission systems allow for a locus of liability to be established so that we can uh, control um, and maintain a degree of accountability within the DLT system as a whole. And that is obviously uh, desirable uh, from the perspective of thinking about, um, uh, thinking about the interoperability. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, looking at, at the context of permissioned uh, systems, uh, permission systems can allow us to build greater functionality into any DLT system. Uh, when we have a permission system and we trust the users that are in the system, we can arguably uh, we can arguably enhance the use cases um, within. Uh, uh, we can arguably enhance the use cases that the DLT system uh, can uh, can apply to. Um, specifically, we can have uh, the use of smart contracts, for example, automated code. Uh, that can trigger the transfer of value, um, whether that be in the form of dollars, um, in the form of tokens, uh, in the form of securities um, throughout. Um, and that is arguably easier within a closed and permissioned system where the users are able to trust each other. Um, next slide, please. Now, in the context of um, building a permission system where we do have 
um, sophisticated uh, use uh, functionality attached to it, where we're using smart contracts to transfer value, um, and where the need for resiliency is growing, um, that obviously raises questions about who gets to participate in the system. Now, the more, uh, uh, the, the, the greater the, the use, uh, the greater the potential for scalability, the greater sophistication of the DLC system, we run the risk that we potentially create high compliance costs and high barriers to entry, um, such that uh, newer companies, smaller companies, um, uh, companies that are just getting off the ground are potentially excluded uh, from participating. Now, what this can mean um, in the context of network effects is the risk that we don't essentially get the network effects that we desire. Um, essentially, that um, uh, companies are unable to join because they cannot afford to do so. Um, and that can potentially limit their economic skin in the game to invest in this technology, to invest in migration, to think about um, how best to reconfigure their systems to, um, uh, to incorporate uh, DLT uh, within their uh, back office. Um, and so there is the danger of a potential negative feedback loop uh, that we are focusing on resiliency, we're focusing on scalability, we're focusing on network effects, we're increasing uh, the sophistication of the system, and at the same time, obviously, that does create costs for those who need to join. Um, and so that is a very difficult value uh, to balance, and we have to think about how best to do so uh, without, of course, impairing or creating any risk for the market as a whole. Um, when we do get to scaling, uh, next slide, please, thank you. Um, when we do get to scaling, uh, one of the issues uh, that we have been thinking about in our committee is the uh, regulatory challenges that we face from a system that is much more sophisticated, that is um, seeing a great deal more activity, and how to make that system resilient in all cases where the, uh, where the uh, use of that system is increasing. In particular, what we are concerned about is that as the DLT system scales up, as its use value increases, as the activity on that system increases, that any system can withstand the heat that will be involved in that context. In particular, we're very worried about latency increases. Um, as Adam mentioned in his presentation for the ALGO committee earlier on, um, that the increased um, activity within the system will lead to greater latencies um, caused by uh, the heightened activities. And we do worry in the context of settlement risk uh, where, greater, where greater latencies can potentially uh, develop risks uh, within the system as a whole. Now, when we think about um, the scaling of a DLT system, we can imagine that for the derivatives markets, that will involve international scaling, uh, where ledgers will be distributed internationally. And that obviously raises a number of regulatory concerns that the CFTC is extremely familiar with in relation to how we regulate and think about uh, data that is distributed across borders. Now, as we saw just from a European decision today, um, there are a number of divergences in data standards with respect to data privacy, data portability, data transfer, uh, cybersecurity uh, that need balancing in this context. And as we'll discuss, or, as we'll discuss later, uh, this is really right ground for standard setting in the context of DLT, where we're essentially looking at international distributed ledgers, a new form of holding information, um, and we have to think about ways in which that information can be secured as well as be um, as well as be compatible with multiple different uh, international laws uh, that don't necessarily see um, that are that are not necessarily uh, comparable. And obviously, the CFTC has gone through ten years worth of rulemaking in the context of uh, of Title Seven, where these issues have been discussed. So we're hopeful um, that when it comes to standard setting, that this can be a useful material to draw upon as we go forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the um, so the other issue that we have been looking at in the context of scaling, and as the DLT system gets gets bigger and more prominent, and as we think about um, the different uses uh, to which we can apply that system, um, is really the issue of system governance, um, and that is a critical issue, and it's one that the CFTC is obviously extremely familiar with in the context of clearing houses and um, exchanges. And the, uh, the question that we have been sort of giving some thought to is what we do about governance in the context of DLT. Now, this is extremely critical from the point of view of the system as a whole. Um, who gets to be in the system is the critical question. What are the conditions of their entry? Um, and importantly, from the perspective of the regulator, from the perspective of market participants, uh, who bears the losses? How are these losses shared within the system? 
And when we think about who bears the losses, how is the decision? How are the decisions taken when it comes to ensuring um, that uh, the system is up to uh, the standards that we want it uh, to operate at? Um, and so, making sure that uh, the decision making, the protocol changes that may be needed what kind of decision-making uh, structure is applicable within the network. Um, these are all critical questions when it comes to governance. Um, and that uh, is obviously um, a critical part of um, any DLT system um, as, it, as it grows, as it becomes more scalable, to make sure that the governance structure that it has ensures that it can be resilient um, and that the members are able to pay for um, and contain the losses within the DLT network itself. Now, these are all um, extremely uh, difficult and challenging questions, and I think they're particularly challenging in the context of a technology that is developing um, at this stage. Um, you know, Mark has outlined some very exciting possibilities for the use of tokenization, um, and there are, as Shauna mentioned, a number of um, use cases that have been explored. Um, within the subcommittee itself, a lot of us have been conscious of the fact that this is really a technology at the early stage of its development, um, that given time and given exploration and given investment, um, that we're likely to see um, you know, a, a, real, a, real, a real potential for it to grow and uh, become more sophisticated and deeper as time goes on. We really see this as a kind of early version of the internet, essentially, and the potential for it um, is really growing and one that um, one that uh, we're excited to see happen, but certainly um, it, it is a process at this stage. And so in the context of that process, in the context of a technology that is growing, we've really been given, giving some thought to what kind of regulatory approaches might be useful in this context to making sure that we're balancing the need for resiliency and scaling with also ensuring that the innovation can happen in the space. Um, now, one... Uh, approach essentially is the tried and tested one, which is to use existing rulemaking, um, existing oversight in the context of new technologies. So um, obviously um, the CFCC um, has been uh, sort of implementing a Title VII uh, that is a go-to uh, framework for, um, uh, for providing a, a set of, a set of uh, a milestones in the context of uh, regulating market infrastructure. And um, that is uh, a possibility in terms of um, using existing mechanisms to regulate uh, new technologies um, that are coming up in this space. The principles of financial market infrastructure, again, provides the guidepost, and the CFTC is obviously an expert um, in implementing uh, those principles. Um, but, you know, some of us did obviously uh, consider that ha using existing approaches, that having um, an existing uh, framework that is already um, in place, whether that is appropriate for technology that is growing. Um, is it fit for purpose? Um, and so in that context, obviously, this does leave open the possibility of creating a new framework. Um, is there something different about DLC um, at this stage that would require, that would give us cause to think about creating a new set of guidelines, a new set of um, risk principles, a new set of, a new approach uh, for the oversight of the system that is in, um, in, its, in its growth stage. Um, and in the context of thinking about and balancing the new versus old, uh, what is new about DLT, what is similar about DLT, we did wish to emphasize the principle of proportionality. Um, and whether proportionality as a guiding value here could be an important one, uh, which is to say that we have, um, you know, that we recognize that innovation is happening and that it's small scale, um, and that regulation ratchets up, um, scales up essentially as the technology scales up. So. Um, as a way to get innovators into the into the into the space, we have a system that is um, essentially geared towards uh, recognizing their smallness, uh, their newness. Uh, but obviously, as the technology expands and becomes more important, um, as its scalability potential is recognized, that the full that the fuller force of regulation then is brought to bear uh, much more concretely. Um, and proportionality is a principle that is um, put to work currently. Um, in the European Union in the context of innovation in the space, and it may potentially be, or a version of it, uh, something that we might consider here as we think about how to regulate um, emerging DLT technologies. Now, um, to next slide, please. I think I'm a bit lost in the slide tech, actually. Um, a final, uh, the next, um, so uh, this is um, the next to final slide. So the um, 
the question that we really had, uh, the, the questions or the, the questions for future work, essentially, that we've had for the CFTC, um, is really thinking about the international picture um, in the context of DLT and where to go with respect to standard setting. And this recaps some of our discussions um, in past texts. Um, which is really um, the the need for international standards um, in the context of DLT to create a sense of the benchmarks that are expected, um, the technological standards that are expected, and that will allow uh, DLT to be an international technology for transactions in this space to proceed cross-border uh, in a safe and regulated way. Um, obviously, standard setting is also important for coordinating oversight. Uh, for making sure that um, regulators are aware who is paying for what, um, for making sure that regulators know who's taking responsibility for what and maintaining data integrity uh, throughout the distributed network. And, you know, one, um, one question, one, uh, one pathway for the CFTC really that we have been thinking about is the leadership role the CFTC can really play in this market. Um, as Chair Tarbert mentioned earlier, you know, we are the envy of the world in terms of our markets and our innovation. Um, and the CFTC has been a leader in regulatory, um, uh, in regulatory innovation and regulatory uh, implementation post our plan. So again, we feel that this is a space potentially where the CFTC can really uh, bring its leadership to bear globally uh, and provide, uh, provide a, a, a blueprint for standard setting uh, going forward. So, um, we really look forward to your questions and your input, um, and thank you so very much for your time and for hosting this chat today. Thank you very much to all the participants. I think those are all very good, uh, strong presentations. I learned a few things. Uh, I understand that I've got a couple questions coming in. I'd like to start first by calling on Eddie Wen. Hi. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's quite, quite very interesting. Um, look, the benefits of distributed ledger technologies, it sounds very compelling and it's been touted for several years, but the implementation and adoption of the technology has been slower than, than many have expected. What do you think is the limiting factor and, and is it just more difficult than people think or does it take time for the technology to mature? And what can we do to accelerate adoption and implementation? I guess I can start. This is Shauna. Uh, we have seen an exponential increase in interest in DLT since COVID-19. And um, the crisis has really pushed many IT departments forward to say, okay, what technologies can we use, you know, to, uh, you know, for example, um, request identity from, from an individual when they walk into their building and confirm that that individual has been tested for COVID-19 mm -hmm. and either as the antibodies or in the future of vaccination. So we're starting to see a huge uptick in interest um, in DLT and also a lot of pilots that have started um, since within the, the past few months. Um, Eddie, this is Yesha. Um, I think that's a, that's a great question that Shauna mentioned. You know, there is there is work happening here, but I, you know, I think there's a couple of limiting factors, which is the need for a network um, and the need for network effects. And essentially, I think there's a bit of a chicken net problem um, in the sense that the technology does remain new; it is untested. We're talking about a lot of money here, um, and the need to migrate uh, systems is obviously expensive. So there's an investment involved in moving to these new technologies and uh, a, a, a case a case is to be made that this technology is worthwhile to bring in uh, i think there's an increase um there is there is an increased um power to those cases um that are currently being made so we've seen in-house a number of leading banks um use dlt for transferring value within their own um just organizational systems um throughout the globe um, as a way to represent value throughout their chain. Now, um, these are small scale in the context of um, DLT globally. These are, these are testing initiatives. We're seeing how well they're working. And as, as that workability case improves, um, that might convince folks to give the technology a try. Um, and I think the, the, the regulatory picture here is also important because, you know, when, when large amounts of money you know, it's being moved. When there's value transfer that's happening, there's obviously enormous amounts of risk and liability. Um, and in that context, the systems that have to be used um, have to really be bulletproof. Um, and, 
existing systems have proved their worth. Um, and so the question becomes, how do we move to this new system that might have certain advantages, but we don't know the regulatory clarity here as to whether or not they fit the bill according to the standards that are currently in place. So I think there's a, a number of issues here that, um, that, are, uh, that are potentially impeding uptake to do with network effects, um, a lack of regulatory clarity, and also the enormous risk involved when we think about its use in the market. And just to add on that, so there's been a lot of, speaking from an architecture kind of uh, mindset, there's been a lot of improvements recently in encryption technologies that just wasn't there even a year ago. There's also massive improvements in decentralized file storage techniques and technologies that that have to work in concert with distributed ledger technology. That There's been just massive uh, improvements in that area. And I referenced in my presentation about multi-token uh, containerization of assets. I mean, you could have done transactions before, uh, you know, a year or two ago, but it, it doesn't scale well when you have uh, millions of transactions under the under that uh, ecosystem at that point. Those changes have happened very, very uh, recently. Now, the last thing is usability. We all know that uh, there needs to be a certain level of abstraction from the business user and from the uh, the, the person interfacing with these technologies to make sure that it's simple. Uh, they don't need to know how electricity works to flip the, white, the light switch, for example. They just need to be able to use it. And there's been some massive improvements in usability that makes this the time is, is, is now more than it was a year ago or even two years ago. Okay, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Bennett, I understand you've got a question. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, and this kind of my question kind of dovetails off of Eddie's question, and it's sort of more focused and addressed to Mark, if you don't mind. Specifically, the ag sector. Appreciate some of the comments you made, um, and and what the seam is doing and, and has done and is trying to accomplish. But I'm just curious to know from your experience um, in in the cotton markets, and then looking at agriculture more broadly, what do you think are the biggest impediments to sort of broader scale implementation um, within the ag sector of, of this type of technology. I think I, I say that specifically because, you know, I think um, a lot of people might not necessarily think agriculture and agricultural producers are, are, are not necessarily technologically innovative or um, creative, but in fact, in, in, my, in my experience, and I think history tells this story that um, agriculture is some of the most um, has some of the most innovative sort of participants, um, you know, in in the world. And anything from seed technology to input technology to logistics and transportation, um, you know, technology is, is the backbone of, of a well functioning agricultural ecosystem. Um, and I've been very interested, I think, in the interrelationship. And this is why I think the CFTC is so unique because we have so many different constituencies. Um, obviously, having a conversation about these innovative technologies within you know, DLP and crypto and, and cyber issues, but we also have our farmers and ranchers and, and, and our ability to sort of act as a convener and bring everyone together and, and sort of have this intersection um, of different parts of the economy, I think, makes both the agency unique, but then these, these discussions unique. And, um, you know, appreciate your thoughts on, on sort of how we get um, as a building block, right, larger sort of um, um, outreach to the agricultural sector, and then as the technology organically grows, um, how do we get larger implementation? Because in the end, I think that means better production, lower costs, um, and, and that's good for the economy and, and I think and the country as a whole. Thanks. Yes, so uh, sure, just to that point, so um, – Agriculture is one of the least digitized industry sectors, as, as many of you know. I mean, it's a lot of paper-based processes that are still there. There's lots of, ex of wonderful innovation on the farm with precision agriculture and things like that. But in the business systems, it's largely – there's a lot of paper-based processes, which means there's opportunity. Now, there's some movements underway, some real exciting movements towards standardizing uh, those those practices in the middle. You may have uh, read about the Digital Container Shipping Association. It's basically a standard, uh, nonprofit standard body that rep is represented by some of the largest shippers in the world. And they're coming together and collaborating to define the uh, 
the communication protocols and the language that we all have to speak in order to interoperate. And to me, that's the most exciting. And I think that has to be in place as a foundational thing before innovation can occur on top of it. Um, and so the tools have been there, the software has been there, the, te the technology has been there for a while. But unless you just embrace a single system or a uh, you know vendor lock-in, you can't participate a lot in, in some of these uh, this interoperability. The exciting part again uh, is the standards that's being created, um, and that will allow the uh, the industry to advance more rapidly. So I'm excited about about where that is. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Richard. Okay, thank you. We've got one final question here for Jaime Working. Hi, uh, I guess my question relates to maybe some of the earlier discussion and how it dovetails to the, the latter part of the presentation where, where, where the earlier discussion focused on kind of use of ERC tokens, uh, which are uh, primarily on, on a public permissionless space system, um, and the later discussion about kind of some of the regulatory considerations about the need for having accountability and governance built into the system. Um, is, is it possible to, to have those features uh, within the context of a permissionless system? Um, it, or or is, the, is, is the regulatory need such that uh, that you would need to have um, some, at least some element of a permission-based system where somebody was controlling the network that the regulators could look to? Um, uh, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, in 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 the context of um, a permissionless system and financial markets, I find it very hard to think of situations in which a permissionless system um, could work um, in the context of providing the sense of comfort and reassurance um, that the system is working. Now, as we've seen in the context of our markets, um, you know, we can have outages, we can have, shut, you know, we can have circuit breakers, we can have um, events, um, and we 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 feel comforted by the fact that there is an operator behind it that will take care of the process. Um, in the context of commissionless systems, we, um, you know, there's a worry that there is no such operator. The system itself has to be automated enough uh, to recognize the problem and shift gears and um, and remedy it. Um, if the technology is robust enough that we can build in or embed some kind of regulation within the blockchain itself um, and make the system sufficiently automated that it is capturing errors and it is essentially regulating itself in that context, um, perhaps there is a chance that we are able to get to a world where the permissionless can work um, in the context of a system that we have which requires some accountability and um, and and resiliency. At the same time, I think that seems a long way away if it's um, available at all. Um, you know, we do we do need liability. We need um, any system. We 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 need a system that will able be able to pay for the damage that it causes. Um, and it's just hard to see how a permissionless system can work that way um, at this present point in time. Thanks. Okay, with that, I think we'll move on to the next uh, panel from the Virtual Currencies Subcommittee. Uh, Chris Brummer will be giving a presentation on uh, an overview of central bank digital currencies. And uh, after that, Tom Chippis, the Chief Executive Officer at ErisX, will be giving a presentation on Bitcoin volatility compared to other asset classes uh, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on asset price correlation. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Chris Brummer. Okay, uh, th th thanks, George, and, 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 and thanks to you for all the time, uh, just to sort of echo Yisha's uh, comments earlier, you know, this, just the amount of time that the staff has put into uh, coordinating this event has been enormous. Thank you to, to, to you. Uh, thanks uh, to, uh, Chairman Tarbert, uh, for really making sure that the agency stays out front and thinking about these issues, uh, and, and obviously a, a special shout out to Commissioner Clinton uh, for his time and, and leadership and making sure that TAC as well is is, is taking the lead on uh, virtual currencies and identifying issues like central bank digital currencies that you know seem 
uh, at first glance, to be a little bit less of, 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 of having implications for derivatives law and derivatives infrastructure. Um, however, um, there are some considerations that I think are at least keep, uh, worth keeping in, in, in mind. Uh, maybe we can just uh, go to the uh, first slide. Okay, so CBDCs uh, have gained uh, an enormous amount of attention recently, like virtually every other form of digital payment. Um, part of the attention has been generated because of the coronavirus pandemic and the idea that um, U.S. governments need swifter payment rails in order to move money to those kinds of uh, constituents um, and, and, and citizens who may need it, and that the legacy infrastructure, whether governmental or in some instances private, just haven't kept uh, up to speed with the needs of society as it has evolved. Um, additionally, uh, part of the interest is also driven by a number of allied concerns, such as competitiveness concerns, and, and concerns as to whether or not economies, in order to remain competitive, and even uh, whether or not uh, currencies, in order to be uh, competitive, need to upgrade not only the payment rails, but as we'll get to a little bit later, the very experience of money. That, you know, think about money as a kind of customer experience, and that the customer experience as it currently exists um, isn't as optimal as it possibly could be. And so, you know, should we change, in effect, how we think about money and how we use money um, in, in, in ways that reflect more of a 21st century orientation. And all of this has just led to an enormous amount of interest and, and energy in the CBDC uh, space. But for all of the talk about CBDC, uh, the term is by no means a standardized uh, term, certainly not as a matter of national or, for that matter, international law. And it's not just because many of these uh, or, or the concept of a CBDC has, has yet to be worked out. You know, um, I had a very interesting conversation perhaps two weeks ago with uh, Benoit Curé, who's the FinTech lead and head um, of the Bank for International Settlements' uh, Innovation Hub, hub uh, who emphasized uh, on a podcast that uh, it would likely stay um, unstandardized and that the, the, the regulation of uh, central bank digital currencies would likely not become a matter of direct regulation um, uh, uh, from uh, the international regulatory community. Uh, but that said, there are a number of widely recognized characteristics of the CBDC. Um, first and foremost, uh, they are a liability of uh, a central bank. Um, thus, they're backed by the government in the same way that current forms of fiat currency are backed by the government, but they are distinct from existing master accounts um, at uh, the Federal Reserve. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there are a number of, of drivers that have accelerated interest in CBDCs, uh, but even prior to the coronavirus pandemic, uh, there were a number of observed potential advantages. One um, that was relevant for uh, developed uh, countries and developed economies was just a widespread recognition that the cost of producing, distributing, and, and destroying physical currencies uh, is, is, is quite high. Um, uh, another was this idea about efficiency. Um, it's something that's been highlighted in the coronavirus pandemic, but has been of enormous interest in developing countries who have been uh, uh, who recognize both the difficulties of physical currency uh, to transcend uh, space and time, more or less, um, and, and, and the difficulties that, that traditional currencies uh, pose in the midst of uh, infrastructures um, and, and communities where people were often unbanked and had but limited access to financial services. Um, now, because the starting points of central banks around the world are very different, uh, where they end up uh, will ultimately be very different. Uh, but there are a number of uh, key design considerations. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, and these key design considerations reflect both where countries are and, and where they want to go. Um, now, one can easily sort of identify six different vectors of CBDC design. Um, the first is whether or not a, a central bank wants to uh, sort of engage or explore an account or token-based model. Uh, 
Um, now, interestingly enough, uh, uh, for those who, who uh, have spent enough time sort of thinking through the bowels of the sort of um, payments infrastructure, um, this kind of nomenclature is in itself uh, uh, sometimes a bit obscured when, when we think about um, sort of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, but, but ultimately, the, the question goes as to whether or not um, access to, the, to a CBDC is tied to an, an identity-based system, sort of a, a, with account-based technology that can um, often rely on, on somewhat reconcili uh, reconciliation-intensive uh, sort of message-based approaches um, that where, where you adjust entries in a, in a ledger or whether or not you're going to have a, a, a kind of a tokenized um, system that operates via cryptographic schemes that don't require uh, identification. Sort of trans uh, the, the question as to whether or not you're going to have more of a digital bearer um, asset or, or instrument. Um, uh, Another important vector in, in question is whether or not you want to design a central bank digital currency um, as being either a retail or, or wholesale-based system. Um, and, and that ultimately uh, overlaps, at least in part, with the account-based or tokenized uh, system. Uh, generally, the question of a retail or wholesale CBDC reflects uh, whether or not the person who is supporting the infrastructure or, uh, uh, or specifically, whether or not um, access to a CBDC is being reserved to uh, the retail public, or whether or not it's going to be reserved as uh, a utility for the uh, commercial banks. But I did want to make a, a quick observation that um, uh, wholesale banking today generally reflects a state of affairs where uh, you have a computerized record of assets and liabilities and, and receivables and payments maintained at the bank uh, uh, level, uh, but they are not really settled, at least not settled effectively, until they're settled at a settlement account at a central bank, right? Um, uh, so a digital fiat currency has, well, I, there's an overlap between this account-based and token-based distinction and the retail and, and wholesale-based distinction insofar as a, a tokenized system could permit a system whereby the commercial banks themselves are um, enabled or permitted to settle amongst themselves using a fiat settlement instrument, um, sort of synonymous to what you know, carrying uh, a, you know, a briefcase full of cash. Um, so, so you have a decentralized settlement system between commercial banks without necessarily having to settle at a central bank. Um, another key aspect that, that uh, or, or design consideration is privacy versus anonymity. Um, the question as to whether or not, um, again, uh, central banks or other intermediaries should be involved, in, involved and, and that has to do with the degree of direct control that, that's being exercised by a central bank, in, in, in our case, the, the Fed. Um, and then whether or not... Um, uh, CBDC should have any kinds of deviations when it comes to interest-bearing uh, features and characteristics and whether or not uh, they should be programmed or programmable. And that's a concept that we'll return to uh, briefly. Uh, though it's not on the slide, uh, uh, I guess I'm inspired a, a bit by uh, Professor Yadis' um, uh, comments and remarks. Uh, another kind of key design consideration with CBDCs um, that can be relevant for uh, the people listening in on this call is whether or not a CBDC should also enable cross-border payment. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, CBDCs um, can be viewed, at least in part, as a solution um, to this cross-border transaction um, challenge. Uh, that has certain kinds of competitive advantages in, in some ways to stable coins. Um, now, uh, stable coins, uh, uh, as many of you uh, know, uh, are privately issued instruments typically used as a store of value or medium of exchange. Uh, it's designed to have a market value that tracks or is pegged to a set amount of fiat currency. Um, 
and, and that's a distinction that we'll get to as well uh, very uh, shortly. That's very important in order to understand both the, the relative strengths and weaknesses of stable coins and what some CBDCs are, are, are trying to do. Um, stable coins are generally token-based. Uh, they're not backed by a central bank, but they could be supported by commercial bank deposits, securities, uh, and other assets, and other, um, including other cryptocurrencies and virtual currencies. Or they can be synthetic and um, supported uh, algorithmically. Um, now, it, it's interesting um, to sort of understand that stable coins, even though they are designed um, to help facilitate cross-border transactions, among other things, they have important limitations. Next slide, please. Sometimes, uh, in short, stable coins don't always uh, uh, solve some of the problems that they uh, are designed to, 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 to solve, and it just depends on the design of a stable coin. Um, stable coins, just like central bank digital currencies, are ultimately under, underpinned by varying degrees of trust in the issuer, since they are being issued privately. And certain kind of, uh, or certain degree of trust that an issuer will uphold uh, varying degrees of obligations. And those obligations don't necessarily have to involve uh, the redeemability of the asset that it is ultimately referencing. Um, but the fact that there is some kind of commitment being made by the issuer of a stable coin um, means that in a stable coin, uh, there is ultimately a, a, an underlying legal claim, if one will, and, and not a cryptographic one. Um, and it's a point that I've been hearing a lot from uh, lately from lots of uh, DeFi experts, and this, this distinguishes and differentiates uh, stable coins from even um, sort of privately I issued cryptocurrencies on public blockchains like uh, Bitcoin. Um, but because uh, that redeemability uh, factor um, uh, it can depend on the facts and circumstances as to the design of a um, stable coin, central bank currencies can be seen as trying to provide uh, more um, um, certainty and, and, and safety, if one will, uh, behind the sort of utility uh, that a traditional stable coin um, uh, aspires uh, to achieve. Um, so what are these kinds of problems that CBDCs are trying to solve? Well, um, like many other stable coins, they're, they're trying to solve this issue of how do you uh, create a 24-7 movement of fiat currencies? How can you facilitate contactless payments? Um, as I mentioned at the outset of, of, of my remarks, um, and then they're trying to figure out the, the, the question of, of riskless settlement. Although with, again, many stable coins, there are some interesting solutions. CBDCs are trying to sort of drive the risk premium even further uh, down. Um, and uh, CBDCs are, are extending fiat uh, uh, incrementally into the possibility of introducing programmable uh, money. So, so that would comprise an upgrade, if one will, over your traditional um, paper-based fiat currencies. Now, this generates a number of, of, of important questions, like um, what is the proper government response, um, not just to, to, to um, stable coins, but also a, a response in terms of how they should or can roll out their own CBDCs, um, or, or, and, and whether or not governments should offer something simpler, um, uh, something that stable coin providers can themselves add varying kinds of layers and services on top of, alongside other financial services professionals. Now, CBDCs, uh, next slide, please. So I guess I'll, 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 I'll run through a couple of um, more obvious issues for those of us thinking about derivatives law. Um, the, the regulatory treatment of the CBDC uh, is, is, is rather straightforward. Um, a CBDC would be a digital fiat currency, and therefore it should at least, um, I, I think the members of the committee agreed, be treated the same as, as any other fiat currency. Um, although you can always ask, and, and these are probably questions for the Federal Reserve and, and, and others, you know, whether or not certain kinds of special policies should be enacted for U.S. dollar issuances, 
Um, currencies are commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act. Um, however, U.S. dollars are typically not themselves. Uh, from a market perspective, the subject of derivatives uh, contracts, although it's interesting to see whether or not um, if the Federal Reserve was to introduce a, a, a CBDC, whether or not this would change. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as to the derivatives market uh, considerations, the, the upslides, I think, um, have been uh, well articulated, at least uh, potentially CBDCs could facilitate the faster exchange of, of payments and collateral for cleared and uncleared contracts. And through the use of smart contracts, CBDCs could be utilized to effectuate real-time or, or closer to real-time settlement of margin or collateral obligations. Um, but there are, 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 are changes that this would um, likely introduce, um, namely the existing role of commercial banks could change, and also clearinghouses, um, FCMs, um, swap dealers, and the like would need to build messaging and settlement systems for the secure transfer of uh, CBDC. Um, uh, when built out, uh, at least presumably programmable CBDCs could also further facilitate the automation of those uh, functions. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the more, more interesting issues uh, involve a little bit of uh, thought experiments that uh, we uh, on the subcommittee had to sort of un undertake and, and discuss with, with one another, um, particularly since uh, there has been no announcement by the Federal Reserve uh, to, to, to introduce or, or to embrace uh, or to pursue a central bank digital currency per se. So um, we have to think through, well, what are the kinds of ways in which uh, derivatives law um, and the CEA um, could be introduced and, and brought into um, or, or, or to become more uh, salient? And it's an important question because not all CBDCs are the same. Uh, a central bank can issue a CBDC in a myriad of ways, um, or, or it could just sanction the issuance of uh, some currency instrument that might include uh, a number of different kinds of elements, um, uh, including swap or some kind of uh, secured product. So uh, on my slide, for those of you who, who don't have it, I have a kind of a, a hypothetical um, where, uh, let's say, a central bank decides against issuing a CBDC directly, but instead goes to um, all the commercial banks or, or just to uh, primary dealers and says, you create a digital dollar in whatever form you want. Uh, we will guarantee, we, the central bank, uh, will guarantee those digital dollars. Or, or say, a central bank says, we will secure those digital dollars with um, mortgage-backed securities or corporate bonds uh, that we've bought over the years. Well, this raises a number of very interesting questions. Among them, uh, is this a, a swap, or does a transaction end up being operationalized in a way that looks like a swap? Uh, is this a security or security-based swap? In addition to, to other structures, um, these kinds of products could very well be CFTC or, or SEC-regulated products. Um, uh, next slide, please. If a oh, – sorry. Now, uh, of course, if it is a swap or a forwarded, forward, and if it's not being traded on a CFTC or SEC-regulated exchange, um, you would need to be an eligible contract participant uh, in order to engage in that transaction. So uh, these alternative currency structures, depending, again, uh, on decisions by the Federal Reserve, um, could end up in outcomes that directly impact the availability of that product uh, to retail persons, because obviously if, if the swap or the forward is not being traded on a, on a uh, uh, SEC-regulated uh, exchange, um, the, the, your, the access uh, to that particular product could be uh, limit and limited and, and limit the usability of the CBDC in smart contracts, again, uh, depending on their structure. Next slide. So um, for, for the sort of balance uh, of this conversation um, and for my presentation, I'll just go through a couple of interesting questions. Um, number one, uh, what if any new custodial challenges would uh, CBDC pose for clearinghouses? Um, as uh, folks on the call know, legacy clearinghouses are largely built for real-time processing on a limited basis uh, for part of the day. 
they rely on partial real time uh, for other functions during the day and, and can go on um, full on batch mode after the market closes. Whereas uh, crypto trading usually takes 20 place, sorry, crypto trading takes place 24 seven. And it, it, you, those of us on the committee were wondering whether or not then, you know, if you introduce a CBDC, whether or not market pressures could induce dramatic changes in the operations uh, shifting to a 24 seven model really to prevent uh, new competitors or existing competitors from listing the same products and, and taking market share. Next slide. Another uh, interesting question and, and very important question is whether or not a CBDC would introduce new cybersecurity risks for derivatives infrastructures. Um, among those kinds of questions, would, would CBDC-related services and infrastructures create larger honeypot risks, uh, given the likely scale of a, of a, of a CBDC? Uh, would responses and backstops be sufficient given likely higher volume of CBDC related transactions? And what kinds of interests would other regulators, including the Fed, take in steps taken by here to largely CFTC regulated uh, entities? Now, as to the sort of cybersecurity uh, risks uh, that could arise, um, certainly there's the possibility that. The, that a CBDC has certain favorable characteristics, at least as, as compared to a, a stable coin. Um, in the context of stable coins, uh, theft is possible, and, and this is very hard uh, to reverse, um, something that we have uh, was hinted at in our earlier uh, conversations uh, today. Um, someone has private keys, so unless you, you do a hard fork of the network, there's no way really to to undo what has been done. Um, on the other hand, you can always freeze accounts, um, like we see with the, the Paxos stablecoin, uh, but you don't have any kind of uh, other mechanism available. Uh, by contrast, if you have a CBDC, uh, they, a CBDC represents a claim uh, usually on a centralized database, at least that's, that's the general assumption. And uh, so you would be able to reverse the transaction um, almost like uh, uh, reversing the ACH uh, transaction. Uh, next slide. W on, on one of the, the earlier uh, slides, we talked about the changing roles of commercial banks if you were to introduce a CBDC. Um, here, um, this, this takes that, that observation a step forward of, of what would a rapid shift to CBDC uh, or, or, um, or would a rapid shift to CBDC impact the financial health of FCMs? Um, here, uh, the movement of accounts to a central bank uh, could, at least in theory, impact the liquidity of FCMs. Um, FCM customers will likely keep their CBDC uh, wherever they are safest and, 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 and most accessible. Um, and again, depending on the degree of intervention by uh, the Fed, and, and the kind of design of CBDC, um, the, the float of FCMs or whatever float that they use to fund themselves um, uh, uh, could be um, uh, compromised. And so uh, some kinds of uh, additional um, precautions uh, or, or, or surveillance uh, could be uh, useful or at least um, might be necessary to to keep in mind. Um, next slide, please. Again, uh, it's useful to, to sort of think ahead uh, because CBDCs are evolving quickly. And the models for CBDCs can vary uh, dramatically. And so one of the questions is, would a platform-based CBDC require new forms of intermediaries for derivatives infrastructure? And this is a, an important question because some countries, including China, are toying with this idea of a platform-based model of money, right? Where, where it's not just a payment rail that is being, that is being uh, taken into consideration, but really the creation of an entire ecosystem of financial services providers. And, and, and this ecosystem could be, in effect, built on top of the payment rails for money. And, and, and this gets to this very important observation that the very definition of money uh, may quickly be subject to, to change and, you know, query whether and how this impacts how we think about our derivatives law. 
Um, but at any rate, uh, an ecosystem built on top of a platform-based model of money could involve, uh, at least in principle, financial services providers that operate in the derivative sector. And additionally, derivative services could at least um, be provided on top of that um, um, uh, uh, platform, creating um, interesting issues of conflict of laws um, or overlapping supervision and supervisory responsibilities as between uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and, 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 and the CFTC. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, hello? Uh, let's see. But I, I, can we please move to the slide? Uh, uh, would the introduction of the CBDC provide a means? Ah, there it is. I'm, I'm not. I'm unsure as to whether or not the the WebEx is actually moving. Uh, it's frozen on my screen, but I, I'll, I'll just keep talking since we're almost uh, done. Um, uh, again, you know, there are uh, base questions as to would the introduction of the CBDC provide a means for easing the cost of regulatory compliance? And the sense was among the, the subcommittee um, that, that the compliance costs themselves should remain relatively uh, stable, uh, but uh, firms could have much greater opportunities to distinguish themselves. In other words, CBDCs themselves could introduce a considerable degree of disruption, and leading to or availing certain uh, firms that are, uh, that are running on more modern, highly efficient platforms, uh, varying uh, opportunities. So some, some firms may keep uh, segregated accounts in real time, event by event, in real processing time and not pulse-based uh, batch, um, uh, batching services um, uh, a few times a day. And, and so what CBDC could do is um, create a new round of, 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 of winners or, and, and, and losers or at least uh, introduce a new kind of um, competitiveness when it comes to in the introduction of new um, uh, uh, digital uh, infrastructure uh, that, that that could be, um, uh, frankly, introduce changes uh, that are even more drastic or at least rapidly evolving than the kinds of changes that we've been witnessing uh, over the last half decade or so. Um, with that, that is the end of my presentation. So I guess I'll just pass the baton now to uh, Tom, uh, Tom Chippis. Thanks, Chris. Okay, I'll wait to see when the first slide comes up here. And uh, recognize I'm going to be a little lag here and what everyone has seen. I'll just uh, I'll keep the train running here. Um, if we flip to slide number two, uh, I'll start off by saying thank you to the commissioners and the chairman uh, for their participation today. I, I know there's certainly been some great presentations I found very helpful. Uh, hopefully I can uh, do the same uh, with this one. And it, really the purpose of this presentation is to provide information regarding the volatility of Bitcoin uh, versus other well-known commodities and securities um, such that we may have some context um, and perhaps uh, dispel any pre-existing thoughts or myths around the volatility of Bitcoin. And we'll talk about Ether as well uh, generally here. Uh, so with that said, uh, if we could advance to slide three, please. So I'm the last presenter, and I have a presentation full of charts and numbers. Um, so recognizing that that is not a new place most people want to be uh, at the end of uh, a couple hours of presentations, I'm going to give you the answers to, uh, to the test now uh, in the hopes that it stokes your interest uh, in what follows. So I'll talk a little bit here about what we discovered after examining the volatility of Bitcoin and some of the other commodities and securities. So first up, you know, what we did is observed how Bitcoin – is on average more volatile than some of the other uh, securities and commodities noted. Um, but there are certainly some stocks that have similar and sometimes even greater volatility. And although we didn't do a, an entire comparison of all stocks, say, versus Bitcoin, 
uh, definitely there were some small small cap U.S. stocks um, that had even greater volatility than than Bitcoin. Um, currently, uh, Bitcoin's volatility and its underlying market structure, um, when combined with some of the uh, non-U.S. venues that offer very high leverage in their derivative products, create some conditions for very sharp price movements. And we'll examine uh, what that is and, and an example where that happened and what that means from a market structure-induced volatility. Uh, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about perhaps where in a mature market, uh, as just as the market matures and we get more oversight and more seasoned participants, you know, will we see some of the benefits that other mature markets have observed with respect to means and methods for um, reducing sort of market structure induced volatility? Um, so, you know, and the last point here is simply that you know, this is still an evolving uh, asset class, an evolving uh, commodity in, in that regards. You know, secure and sound operations are going to help market structure be better. And uh, perhaps we can think about how we can strengthen what we do here in the U.S. to provide alternatives to, to venues that um, may be perceived as riskier or uh, be at different levels of maturity. Um, so that's really what we found and what we're going to talk about. So why don't we advance to slide four, please? And... Just to set the context for you, we, we looked at the period of uh, January of 19 uh, through June of 2020. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, Bitcoin and Ether are on average uh, more volatile than some of the traditional stocks uh, that were analyzed in this study. Um, but with that said, um, some of those stocks did have, as noted here, substantially higher volatility than Bitcoin or Ether during the same period. So. Uh, you can't talk about volatility in stocks nowadays without mentioning Tesla. And close to one-third of the time uh, in this study, uh, Tesla was actually more volatile than Bitcoin. So that's obviously a U.S. listed security trading on the U.S. equity markets, which have substantive criteria and controls uh, to try and address volatility. Uh, gold and, and Bitcoin are, are oftentimes contrasted. And in this analyzed period, gold volatility is much lower than Bitcoin. And certainly for those that are cryptocurrency aficionados, uh, the adage that Bitcoin is digital gold and what have you is, is often discussed. And uh, there's more than a fair share of active Twitter battles between uh, Bitcoin aficionados and gold bugs. Um, so we thought it was important to include gold here. Uh, and in this period, gold was lower, but there'll be some anomalies I point out a little bit later. And say, lastly, you know, given sort of the unique circumstances surrounding crude earlier this year, no one should be surprised that uh, crude's volatility was substantially higher than Bitcoin's, and we'll show some of the correlations as well a little bit later on. So opening observations here, if we move to slide five, what about COVID-19? Certainly, we've had the uh, response to the pandemic uh, so we do have a bit of a uh, unique opportunity here to look at some historical data and then both very recent but very narrow time period of data um, where generally we've observed market shocks across geographies and asset classes. And what has it meant in uh, crypto? So during this time period, uh, the first row is the January 19 to Feb 2020 period, and then the bottom row being what I've roughly referred to here is the period of the outbreak, March through June. Um, what you can see is, uh, you, know, you can't see it clearly here, but we noted in the text, the analyzed stock volatility went up 265% um, as compared to Bitcoin's, which was up 178 and Ether 188%. So the stocks analyzed here uh, were substantially more volatile. I should say had a substantially larger increase in their volatility. Um, GE, Tesla, and crude represented there with uh, USO. Uh, also had increases during this period on par or greater than that of Bitcoin or, or Ether. So so what do we take away from that? So even during what was a highly volatile time in the markets, the change to volatility of Bitcoin and Ether are not outliers. There's definitely not outliers. And, and you can see that by, by some of the comparisons here. So they may have high volatility as compared to the absolute measures on some of the other uh, issues here. However, the, the amount of change of volatility in many cases is actually uh, on, on par or lower. And again, crude oil was a bit of an outlier here for, for the reasons specified earlier.
Okay, if we move on to slide six, I want to talk about a specific event that took place in March of 2020, and I refer to it here just for sake of convenience as the BitMEX liquidations. Now, for those of you not familiar with BitMEX, um, BitMEX is a crypto-only derivatives market that operates outside of the U.S., and uh, in March of 2020, there was a, a period where there were there were about $1.1 billion worth of uh, contracts liquidated. And the types of contracts that trade on BitMEX are perpetual futures. So um, that's a long conversation in and of itself. And actually, BitMEX provides some, some great explanatory information about their products on their site, uh, which I'd encourage you to read if you want to learn more about them. But in short, uh, liquidations of these perpetual futures contracts take place through something called auto deleveraging. And this auto deleveraging happens when at the value periods, and there's multiple value periods a day, um, to the extent that holders of these contracts uh, either owe uh, uh, more than they can uh, pay in terms of the uh, collateral they posted, uh, their, their collateral is liquidated and there's a payout made. Uh, to the other side. I'm grossly over-summarizing for, for brevity, uh, but in short, these auto-liquidation events add selling pressure to the Bitcoin spot market. So this is one of those um, market structure-induced uh, volatility events that I referred to in my introduction. Now, now making matters worse, um, back on March 12th to 13th, uh, when this all began, uh, we note here Bitcoin's price drop from 7300 to $3,900, um, and that occurred 9 a.m. UTC, so that's 5 a.m. Eastern, I believe. And uh, while all this was going on, a bit further into the event, uh, BitMEX suffered a distributed denial of service attack. Um, so that, of course, made matters worse. And what this did is it precluded the liquidation engine uh, from actually liquidating the collateral. So it stopped liquidating for a period of time and that temporarily relieved the selling pressure from the market and that's the highlighted section of the graph you see on this particular slide and during that time uh, as we know Bitcoin prices did go up 23 uh, percent so I want to emphasize I'm, I'm not trying to call out uh, any you know right or wrong here with respect to the BitMEX products I think they've been exceedingly transparent there's a, a link actually on this presentation uh, to their full explanation of what occurred that day. So I'm not, I'm not making a statement of good, bad, or otherwise. I'm simply using this to highlight that there are structural events that when certain activities within that structure that's being created take place can induce volatility in the underlying spot market. So there's a, there's a cyclicality to all of this um, when you take into account the timing of these leveraged liquidations. And it stands in contrast, of course, to the way markets operate in the U.S., whether it's a margin product or, or similar to what we have at RSX, a fully funded product. So there's different structures, um, and that structure can impact and have an impact on volatility in the underlying uh, spot market. Okay, why don't we advance to slide seven, please? And we'll shift from talking about volatility to talking about correlation. So cor correlation, always with the proviso that... Uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean causation. We're just focusing on correlation here. And uh, what's interesting here is in this period, Jan 19 through June 2020, uh, the correlation of both Bitcoin and, and, and Ether is consistently high and has been particularly high during the outbreak, approaching and getting to, to complete correlation for a couple of brief periods. Um, with that said, the Bitcoin and, and, it's, and Ether versus dollars compared to both stocks and gold those correlations are not consistent over the measurement period, as evidenced by the movement on this chart, with correlation being depicted uh, vertically on the left-hand side. I will note there's a short period of negative correlation, uh, meaning moving opposite to one another rather than, than with each other, of Bitcoin versus gold during March of this year. We just talked about that event in March. You can see that in that March period. That is the, uh, I'll call it uh, turquoise-ish line uh, depicting uh, Bitcoin versus uh, versus gold, uh, and there is a reversion back to positive correlation. And it would be a longer study to dig into some of the details there, but it's just pointing out that 
uh, when the spot market moves, it does impact uh, the correlation here as well. So uh, these are one month correlations. If we uh, move ahead to slide eight, and uh, I'll give you credit. It's the last slide of my presentation. So you made it. Uh, you had the answers and you hung on to the end. So um, during the COVID-19 period, uh, what was the impact on correlation between all of these? So we just have a couple of simple matrices set up here. And as one would expect, uh, the correlation during the pandemic period increased really across all the pairs. The, the biggest change um, was that of, of, of Ether and Bitcoin uh, versus gold, where in the previous period, it, it really was statistically zero and then rising to a 60% correlation during the COVID outbreak. Um, now, the data shows that generally uh, Bitcoin and Ether are, are not correlated with the stock market nor gold, but I think what we can take away from the data presented here is that when you have these, these extreme conditions, these market-wide movements across uh, a, a wide dispersion of asset classes, uh, correlation rises along with those sorts of events. So I think it's really important to note that um, the period of time analyzed here, and of course the, the stocks and indices and other commodities analyzed here, yielded these results. If we were to use different uh, 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 commodities or securities or indices for comparison, we of course could get another result. And I'd also observe that as Bitcoin and Ether uh, and cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies generally mature, you, we're going to see a broader field of market participants trade these, as we see now. And as they trade these commodities, we should expect these measures, both volatility and correlation, to change again. So this is definitely my caveat emptor. Uh, this data is accurate as of now, but there are many, many factors and conditions um, that can change that would render these observations correct and interesting at a point in time, but at another point in time, they could be uh, substantively different. So hopefully, uh, as I indicated at the beginning, you take away that uh, Bitcoin and Ether certainly are more volatile than, than some U.S. stocks and other commodities, but um, many times there are other uh, assets that are more volatile. And you know, there is a market structure component to consider when looking at, at, at Bitcoin specifically um, that can create cyclical uh, volatility, uh, but ultimately, as we bring more people into the markets and they operate on exchanges with uh, controls around them, it will have the potential to reduce some of that, although the unique 24 by 7 global nature of the commodity means it may not be something that can be as tightly controlled as you may find uh, in markets we're more familiar with uh, here in the U.S. Uh, so that's the end of my prepared comments, and I'll turn it back over to Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Tom and Chris. Uh, appreciate your presentations. They were both very informative. I do have a handful of questions that have already come in. Um, I want to start with a question that Gary DeWall asked me to relay. Um, and his question is for Chris Brummer. Uh, other than possible security concerns, Chris, are there any other potential concerns regarding the introduction or use of CBDCs? Right. Well, well, there are uh, uh, a, a number of concerns. I mean, from a practical level, uh, privacy is, is, is going to be an enormously important issue. It sounds like, obviously, you know, something that, that would not be or fall in, in the radar of uh, uh, deri derivatives markets professionals, but it, it is of, of enormous importance because how the design of the CBDC is ultimately effectuated can impact um, uh, all kinds of reporting requirements that you can imagine getting upstreamed by varying um, financial market uh, participants. In other words, there's a, it, that's usually considered to be a kind of a social layer of the CBDC where people are concerned about the degree of anonymity and if you're going to create some kind of digital bearer instrument, um, how or whether or not, you know will will the federal government be, uh, be able to track specifically uh, on an individual basis the spending habits of, of of individuals? But that that particular conversation on privacy, you could imagine, could ultimately have some real um, implications uh, uh, for uh, transactions 
um, that are effectuated even for, for instruments that may reference them. Um, but uh, uh, CBDCs, by definition, um, are, are going to have a number of, of implications, not just for securities markets, but potentially for derivatives markets. Um, and, and even when you get into the social layer of, of questions, they may end up trickling through the back door into the province of um, the CFTC and other derivatives um, market participants, not just in terms of how they comply with those rules, but, but how they could then uh, have a residual impact on uh, some of their compliance obligations under the CEA. And I think it's just a matter of time of sort of seeing how that would specifically play out. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, we've got another question now from Yesha Yadav. Yesha, you want to ask that question? Sure. Uh, and thank you so much to Chris and to Tom for a uh, predictably um, awesome uh, presentation. They really learned a great deal. Um, so for Chris, I had a question. Um, the dollar obviously is a reserve currency across the globe, and it's used um, you know, throughout the world um, to settle transactions. Um, in the context of a CBDC and a transition to CBDC, how do you see that playing out um, in terms of uh, some of the complications you mentioned? You uh, noted the lack of standardization that is anticipated here in terms of the, um, the, the payment uh, systems across the globe, um, in terms of the access to these payment systems for users across the globe. So when we, see, when we have the dollar as dominant um, today, um, do you foresee any issues? going forward, um, particularly given your work and scholarship in this area, um, to that, uh, given this transition to CBDC. Um, and for Tom, I just had, I had a quick question. Um, excellent, obviously, terrific. Um, so did you, did you um, see any issues with clearing houses um, and the risk mitigation mechanisms put in place uh, with the Bitcoin volatility and ether volatility and the correlations as well? Um, did did you feel um, that the risk mitigation mechanisms, the margin, et cetera, that's currently put in place um, was sufficient um, to deal with the risks? And do you see um, the current measures will be um, robust enough to withstand any possible sort of any any um, any uh, future disasters that may lie in wake in 2020? So um, those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, this is Chris. Um, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll answer, but also I, I, I'll uh, piggyback uh, for, for Tom if he has, has a chance. Um, uh, just you know, your, your, your charts were so interesting, and I uh, the, the, the correlation was so stark. Um, in my presentation, you know, we were talking about the rise of stablecoins, and, and part of the uh, boom in stablecoins uh, has to do with potential uh, hedging done by individuals looking to basically hedge against uh, crypto. Um, but, but yet you're seeing in, in gold and, other, and in other instances um, uh, interesting uh, correlation. Um, I don't know if you happen to have an observation just on that general phenomenon and, and, and how that plays into the stable coin conversation. Um, but Yesha, as, as in, in response to your question, uh, which, which I think goes more to the international competition uh, uh, question, if I understand it correctly, is, is, is really uh, pretty basic. Um, uh, the former CFTC chairman, Christian Carlo, as many of you know, has been really uh, thinking through, uh, along with uh, Dan Gorfine, um, uh, sort of the place of what a digital dollar would, would, would look like from the standpoint of the provision of different kinds of financial services. And I've worked with the Digital Dollar Foundation a bit in, in trying to think through how that would uh, work. But the the financial inclusion aspect to that is 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 pretty big. It's driven uh, for sure uh, innovation or at least attempts to innovate in developing countries who are not necessarily looking to transplant the u s. dollar on a global scale, but maybe looking to increase their market share as money or as currencies at a regional uh, level. And if you know, if, if enough countries or regions are, or countries in regions are successful at doing that, then, then I guess collectively it could start to impact the global, global aggregate um, sort of dominance, if one will, of, of the dollar. 
Um, uh, one interesting person, Barry Eichengreen, uh, one of the world's leading sort of um, uh, peak economists, uh, talked specifically about this and also observed that, you know, if, if, if there's really going to be, however, a, a real threat to the dollar's usage, uh, it would have to come from one of the major currencies, you know, um, major upgrades either by China or by the ECB. Although, again, he also had recognized that innovations at the micro level uh, could end up ultimately in the aggregate impacting sort of the, the, the market share uh, of uh, the U.S. dollar. So even relatively small actors together, if, if successful, um, could have a noticeable uh, impact. Um, and with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Tom. Thanks, Chris. Um, with respect to the question regarding the sufficiency of, of clearing um, in some of these more uh, volatile pairs we've observed. Um, I'm not aware of any issues on settlement. Uh, I, I certainly can tell you there have been none on RSX, but speaking more broadly uh, with respect to even non-U.S. markets, I'm not aware uh, of any taking place. Um, certainly the BitMEX example I gave you here is one where uh, the, the collateral posted drives uh, sort of the, the worst loss outcome and uh, again, it's a, it's a longer conversation to explain how that particular product works. But in short, I'm not aware of any issues, haven't seen any issues. Um, I think I would not be the only one to say that uh, for the second part of your question, um, am I comfortable that all future disasters could be averted? Um, we're, we're playing 2020 on expert mode, so I'm not sure what's coming next. Uh, but I'm comfortable that what's in place is definitely uh, sufficient for what we've seen today and what we can expect today. And through the volatility we've experienced to date so far, I'm not aware uh, of any issues. So I hopefully that answers your question. But if not, happy happy to clarify anything. Thank you, Chris and Tom. I've got another question that Eddie Wen asked me to relay. Uh, it is directed for Chris Brummer, and the question is that he sees in the CBDC slides that you noted the possibility of disintermediation. If CBDC is issued, and you know what impact would this have on financial stability and economic growth? So, uh, that, in particularly, that's a great you know, question. One, one, one quick add on that. In particular, what would the implications be on FCMs, and, and do you think the benefits are worth the potential trade-offs? <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, that is uh, a uh, – uh, I, I don't even know how yeah, – I want to say the $1 billion question. I don't know if it's the $1 trillion question, um, uh, but it is a great question. Uh, ultimately, if you create um, – you know, again, depending on the design of the CBDC and whether or not you have a CBDC that enters into the wholesale space or into the retail space, um, if you have a retail CBDC – where ultimately um, the money creation that has been reserved uh, to the central banks is somehow now being sort of reasserted by the Federal Reserve and, and where people and individuals are taking their money out of, of commercial bank deposits and, and putting that money in uh, central bank uh, deposits, uh, 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 that, that is naturally going to have a destabilizing impact on some of the um, sort of, uh, intermediaries uh, in the financial system. And um, as, as a result, uh, for some of the broker deals, I mean, for some of the FCMs, uh, it could, at a, at a minimum, begin to complicate uh, sort of the, the, the float that they use in order to, to, to engage in their, um, uh, in their transactions. Um, only because um, for the purposes of, of being complete, you know, uh, there's no uh, sense really that, 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 that there's any central bank that I know of that's, that's necessarily looking to disintermediate their local financial systems to, to, to that degree. And there's a number of reasons for it. Um, you know, central banks don't have experience onboarding uh, customers and they're interesting AML uh, KYC uh, questions, and then there are uh, even more profound questions about, well, you know, if, if the money is, is taken out of a, of a bank, how 
and what happens to lending just overall, and, and, and if that ends up oddly um, undermining the capacity of financial institutions to, to, to lend, does that create some kind of uh, knock-on uh, uh, effects for GDP growth, much less uh, monetary stability or instability. So, so no one, no one knows. And 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 just as we're sort of operating at the frontier of what is money, you know, we're we're also operating at the frontier of of of, of um, sort of digital economics and the transmission of, of of monetary policy and and banking services. But. It is clear that if, if, you know, the greater that penetration by a, a central bank, the, the more um, uh, that risk it becomes something you have to take uh, seriously uh, in terms of the, the design of a CBDC. So you put a cap in terms of how much money people can, can move over or, or certain kinds of speed bumps, you know, and, and, and the more it, it, it would become uh, relevant uh, to the policymaking and, and supervision that's being exercised uh, by the CFTC. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the for the questions. And I think we are ready to wrap up now. So for that, I will hand it over to uh, Megan Tete. Thanks, Richard. Um, we'll now move on to closing remarks. Um, I think we'll start with Chairman Tarber, if you have anything you'd like to say. Uh, thank you very much. I, I don't have anything in particular other than to say that this has been tremendously beneficial for me, and I very much appreciate all of the hard work uh, that, uh, for the presenters that have gone into these presentations. They've been uh, very valuable and insightful, and I will give them a lot of thought in, in the weeks ahead. And I also want to thank again uh, my fellow commissioners, particularly Commissioner Quintens, but also, most importantly, all of the members of the TAC for spending uh, your time uh, on these matters. It is very, very important to our commission and how we consider policy issues. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Benham? Thanks, Megan. Um, just to echo the chairman's comments, thanks to all the committee members for your work, your contributions. Um, and your your counsel really on these important issues, a broad range of topics that I think touch every part of um, what we do at the CFTC. So uh, a big thanks to all of you, um, especially <clears throat> Megan, your leadership as DFO and, and Richard as chair of the committee. Uh, and of course, a special thanks to Commissioner Quintens for his leadership on the TAC and bringing up these important issues for us to um, to hear about and consider from a policy perspective. So. Um, with that, wish everyone well and, and um, you know, obviously safety and good health in, in these in difficult times. And uh, certainly looking forward to seeing everyone as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Berkowitz? Yes. Uh, also, uh, like to thank everybody. It, um, extremely informative. And we, we could go on for hours on, on each of these topics. And um, I feel we uh, very helpful presentations, but uh, really scratching the surface, and you, you've uh, uh, really um, very thought-provoking presentations and questions, and and it's been very helpful. So thank uh, all all the uh, TAC members, and, and thank you, uh, Megan and Richard and uh, Commissioner Quintens for your for your leadership and um, and sponsoring this uh, really important committee. So thank you all again, and and be safe. Thanks. And now we'll go to Commissioner Quintens. Uh, thank you. Megan, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, I had gotten disconnected and had to call back in, so I wanted to make sure my line was open. Um, th thank you uh, to um, all of the presenters today for what I thought were um, fascinating and uh, very helpful and insightful uh, comments, thoughts, discussions, interpretations. Uh, on each of their topics. Um, uh, I, I think everyone knows this, but uh, uh, I'd just like to highlight that, um, you know, what, what is presented today is actually the result of uh, a number of uh, conference calls that take place on a weekly or biweekly basis um, in which these, you know, very talented and uh, quite busy people uh, uh, give their time and energy uh, so that the commission can benefit from their thoughts in this kind of format. And I'm, I'm just very grateful for, you know, obviously not just the um, 
participation today, but the consistent participation uh, in in those in those calls, um, you know, between meetings and uh, for the last uh, number of months and, and few years here. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for another uh, great and uh, successful meeting. Megan, thank you to you for your leadership. Uh, thanks again to our subcommittee, um, ADFOs, uh, John, uh, Scott, uh, George, and Phil, um, and uh, Richard, uh, again to you for, for your leadership and uh, guiding hand on, uh, on uh, motivating the discussion. Uh, and with that, uh, Megan, I'll turn it back to you to close the meeting. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Um, with that, this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>